Are we fine for both the power operators? Yep. Good day. Are you keen? You're so keen. Yeah. Fire away. I like to know if our uh, relatives that are uh, passed on, that have passed on, uh, can they, they couldn't speak English when they were here. Can they understand you if they're here with me? Well, uh, for many people who are relatives who have passed on that speak a different language or speak a different language to myself, what happens firstly is they have to learn the language still, because they don't, uh, they can't feel my feelings, so therefore they have to interpret my words. And when you get to the celestial kingdom, uh, the, above the seventh dimension, the way you communicate is very different and you don't need to learn language because you can feel everything from the person exactly as it, as it happens to them. And, uh, and you can feel their every intention and every thought and every feeling that they have at the moment they have it. But when you're still, some of your relatives are still down in the first sphere and the second sphere, and uh, those people you, who do speak their language generally, and the only time they feel drawn into learning another language if that, is if they feel it's important to do so. So it just depends on whether they've learnt it or not. So if they're here with me now, they cannot understand what you said. Uh, they can if they've learnt the language. It takes about 15 minutes of our time on Earth for them to learn the language. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't take long if they want to. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, if that actually, for many of them, they can learn the language within a few minutes. Um, the, the other thing is they can read the thoughts of everyone's mind as well. And a lot of thoughts don't happen in language. So, so they don't need a la language to listen to, the, to read the thoughts. But they find it very difficult to read the thoughts of a person who's in higher development than themselves. So it makes it very difficult. If they are trying to read the thoughts of a higher spirit, they can't do that. They can only read the thoughts of a person who's at the same condition or in a lower condition than themselves, generally. Does that make sense? Yeah. So many of them are listening. Yeah, of course. And, uh, you know, usually at these sessions, uh, you're the minority and the spirits are the majority. Um, in the uh, presentation we had at, uh, in England, there were over 5 million spirits present, but there were 5,000 spirits who came along with, e with the people who came. So, so there was 5,000 of them, and then there were over 5 million listening all together. Yeah? And, and that often happens in every group. Sometimes in Australia we have literally billions of spirits listening at different times. Yeah, yeah that's a funny question. So spirits, do they fit in the room? Well, <laughs> this, this physical structure does not matter to them, and neither does the cold. So, so the reality is it's like a great big amphitheatre. For them, where they can all just crowd around, layers upon layers, all the way back, and, and there's literally millions of people can listen at the same time in the spirit world. And because of my own intention to, to speak with them while I'm speaking, all of them can listen at the same volume. So, so they, they don't need an amplifier or something like that to listen to those things, to the things that are spoken. And that frequently happens at gatherings on earth with all different types of religious and spiritual matters. But uh, generally we have far more spirits surrounding um, these groups than we have any other. And that's why sometimes you feel quite heavy. Um, and in, in England we just had a meeting a week ago and it was very, very heavy. <laughs> um, because there were quite a lot of spirits there who, um, who were oppressed when they were on earth and so they had this real heavy feeling in them as well of their oppression and, and they were affecting the people who were present on earth at the group as well which they always do so, yeah. but usually if we invite our relatives to come along the ones who listen to our invitation will come along but it doesn't mean all of them came <laughs> it's only the ones who want to stay there and listen is there so, so many spirits around because it's you? Yeah, or is it, is it in uh, every place? Um, there are a, a lot of, almost all the spirits now in the spirit world do know who we are. There are a group of spirits uh, who want to attack me uh, because of knowing who I am. And uh, those spirits uh, have 
investments in people not believing anything that I say. And then there are a large group of spirits, when I say a large group, billions of spirits who know who I am and who are supporting what I'm doing on earth. So, and they are often present waiting to help other spirits who listen to the presentation. So that's why it gets busy around us a lot of times. And that's why sometimes when people come to the groups they feel quite uh, uh, heavy at times too because of the amount of influence uh, around them. Some of the subject matters too have a huge impact. Um, so when we talk about uh, anything to do with the law of compensation, which is a law that's to do with uh, morality and, and the effect of immorality on the soul, many of very heavy spirits come to listen to that. But because they're very heavy, um, often the group feels very heavy as a result as well. So the group feels the emotions of the spirits. The key is to deal with those, all of those things emotionally anyway. The truth is always beneficial for everyone involved, including the spirits. So it's very important that these spirits listen to and hear this truth. Many of them have not had the opportunity to hear truth for most of their life in the spirit world. And so I welcome them coming to each group. And many of them actually, your questions, many of them are influencing your questions. Um, and, and that is also good, because it means that they can interact through you in the discussion. Yes? Um, it's a bit more difficult if I hear a spirit ask a question, or feel a spirit ask a question, if I start talking and giving them an answer, you don't hear the question. <laughs> and so if it's great if they can reflect that question through you, and uh, then we can engage the, the question and answer type of thing uh, much more easily. So that happens frequently, all the time in fact, uh, in these groups. There are many spirits who are here who are only hearing this for the first time. So they, they live in this location, in the, in the first dimension. And I've never ever heard that there are other dimensions. They've, some of them uh, have heard through, like, I suppose you call it Chinese whispers, you know, they hear a whisper from here or there, that there might be such another thing. But many of them have never had a personal experience of it, and so they don't know. And, uh, and what's really lovely about these gatherings is while we're discussing this, many of the celestial spirits, the ones that live above the seventh dimension, they come with us uh, to these discussions and they try to help the spirits who are in the first dimension listening to these discussions. And the reason why it has such an effect on those spirits is because when they have to come to earth to listen to somebody speak, they are automatically connecting with their earth-based um, experience more fully. Whereas when they're in the spirit world, they don't connect as easily to their earth-based experience, particularly if it happened many thousands of years ago. And so it's very hard for them to relate to things. But if, if, if they come to Earth, they can listen, they, they automatically feel about their own life when they are on Earth. And that causes them to be more emotionally connected with their own life. And, and so it's often easier to help them understand truth as a result. Yeah. And what we will do, I feel, is if we just describe the process of uh, growth, in terms of the growth of the soul, and then what we'll do is get to the specific questions relating to reincarnation, in terms of, you know, why do people have past life experiences, and what, why do they remember things, and what, what's going on with all of these different things, and what it's like to actually be reincarnated compared to what everybody thinks it's like. Um, we'll talk about some of those comparisons as well. So let's proceed with that, shall we? Now, remember I finished with the thought that soul development is the key thing that determines the location in which you arrive. Right? Now, if your soul is quite developed in love and truth in particular and, and is quite humble, then you will arrive in a higher location than the first <coughs> sphere. But the majority of people on earth arrive in the third, first sphere of the spirit world. And in fact, the majority arrive in the hells of the first sphere of the spirit world. Now, a lot of people don't like hearing that, of course, uh, because then they worry about where they're going to arrive <laughs> in the spirit world when they march. My, my feelings are, it's more important to know the truth about condition than not. So it's more important to understand what determines condition. 
Now, in the first sphere, fear dominates. So if you find in your own life that fear dominates your life, then it's likely you will arrive in the first sphere of the spirit world as well. Of course, anger is a subset of fear. So if you find that you are, have a, have a and I'm, I'm not talking about overt anger here. I'm talking about what's actually in your heart. So if in your heart there is frustration and annoyance quite frequently, then there is quite a degree of anger in your soul. Highly likely you will arrive in the first sphere of the spirit world while that is present. And other emotions? Shame. Now, persons who are in complete emotional denial also generally arrive in the first sphere. Right? So there are many men on the planet who believe themselves to be quite highly developed, but who are actually in denial of emotion, and therefore in denial of their own core existence, and they are often arriving in the first sphere as well. So you can see that the first sphere, the, the reason why most people arrive there is because these are the types of emotions that are truly within the soul, or they are in complete denial of their true condition. In fact, it's harder to help a person in that state than in this state. It's actually easier to help a person who is angry or afraid or ashamed than it is to help a person who's in complete intellectual denial of any of their emotions. This state is very, very difficult. It's almost like a soul-frozen state, and, um, and there are many people on earth passing in this state of denial. Um, in terms of helping them, it's also very difficult for spirits to help them as well, because they wish to hold on to their own beliefs and they are in complete denial of their true emotions. And so they are in complete denial of their true condition. Yeah. And this makes life very, very difficult for them for a long time in the spirit world before they are more humble and can start to feel some of these emotions inside of them. Yeah. By the time you reach the second sphere, you still have fear but fear no longer dominates your existence anymore. So from now on, the thing that dominates is your desire for truth. That now starts to dominate your, your condition. Now, it's not your desire for your own truth. It's your desire for the absolute truth that is true in here. There are many people in the first dimension who desire truth or think they desire truth but they're really just desiring their own truth. Here they start to desire the truth of the universe. How does the universe actually work? What's actually going on? What's really going on? Why am I really here? I think I'm here because of this, but what's my real reason why I'm in a certain location and so forth? Truth starts to dominate their perspective now. So you can see that's the reason why not many people arrive there. Because most of us are in more of a fear, feeling, and our fear dominates our life. You remember the question I asked yesterday about are you doing exactly what you want to do? That's an indication about fear dominating life. As you, you can, now, very important to recognise, whether you're a spirit or a person on earth, you can progress in the spirit world without returning to earth. Right? This is... When, when a lot of spirits hear this, they are often relieved. Because they had a terrible life on earth the first time, and many of them don't want to come back. And so they are relieved often that they don't have to come back. There's no need at all to come back, no matter what condition you arrive in the spirit world. No need whatsoever to come back to earth. And in fact, the person in this condition cannot come back to earth. At all because they still have their spirit body attached to their soul and it's a physical impossibility to stuff that spirit body into another spirit body. Right? And so, which was what would they would need to be able to do to return. So it's actually a physical impossibility to return to Earth. And when you're in this condition, this condition, this condition, right, and, and right the way up to the soul union condition, it's impossible to come back to Earth. And that's why I say, 
nobody's come back to Earth historically, uh, up until very, very recently. Okay. Now, that brings us questions of, all right then, why do so many people on Earth believe in reincarnation, and what are the actual things that are actually happening? Doesn't it? Mm. So, let's look at the reasons why people believe in reincarnation. Carolla earlier mentioned one, and that is the old soul concept, which is little children saying things and you know, speaking about things that are way beyond what they've ever been taught or way beyond what they have actually had to learn themselves. So how does that happen? That's a question we need to ask. Right? Any other things? Someone mentioned yesterday um, regression. Uh, past life regression. So we write that down. Where people go through a process where they seem to have had a different life than the one that they currently are having. Yes? And they seem to remember bits and pieces of that life. Yes? So that's uh, another thing that causes people to believe in reincarnation. Is there any others that you can think of? Yeah. Sorry? Deja <coughs> vu experience that you think that you've been deja vu. Oh, okay, deja vu, yes, deja vu. Sorry, I'm Australian, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, a feeling that you've been there before. A feeling that you know this person, you've met them before. That kind of feeling? Yes? Okay. Any others? Not only the feeling, but you, that you actually find your place, in a, your, your place around when you walk in, in a new place and you actually know how to walk. Okay, and yes. And okay. you recognise where you are at. So can we separate that and maybe call that a knowledge? Yeah. Of, uh, should we just bunch it all together and call it things? Persons, places or whatever. That, that seems to just be there even though you've never been there before. Yes? So a knowledge of things, or, or should we call that a... Um, um, well, knowledge of things, we all know what that's referring to, yes? So we'll, we'll leave it like that. So any other? Uh, Christine? Uh, memories, maybe. You think they're yours, and it's... Alright, yeah, five. Memories. of a different life. Of a different... How do you spell it? Life? Yes? Um, uh, they believe that the talents you, you have, uh, you have sort of trained them up. Have that oh, that you've chosen your parents? No, no? Oh, that uh, if I'm if I'm very good at painting, ah, I yes. have had very I have trained that for different lives to be able to be good at painting. Oh, okay, like natural abilities. Yeah, you uh, sort of if that it's not uh, created by God, but me myself has uh, through my desires yeah. through my lives uh, uh, trained uh, trained them up. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. The karma of the station you're brought into, like what, how, like... Yeah, so now we're getting down to philosophies, aren't we? So you could say, Seven, there's this idea of karma, <laughs> that if I was bad in a previous life, then I have a worse station in this life, um, or even that I'm an insect in this life, it could be that bad. <laughs> um, does that make sense? Or, so this idea that whatever I've done in the past life, I now have to bring forward into this life and work my way through somehow. To uh, justify why this life is so To painful. justify why this life is so painful, yes. Or why bad things happen to people like they're murdered because of them. Or why bad things happen, yeah. So now we're talking really, these are now philosophies now, more than actual experiences. Can you see the difference? Uh, this is all actual experiences where people actually have an experience. This is now more of a philosophy that tries to explain these experiences. Mm. Yeah? So karma trying to explain the pain. So as an explanation. 
of pain. I would say that seeks also is the philosophy more than an experience. Um, true, because we can explain that with other exactly. methods, can't we? Yes. 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 Yeah. Although, although this is very interesting because some people, you know, three years of age, they can compose symphonies. Why yes. is that? Yes. Well, you know, obviously something's going on and we need to understand what. And yeah. a lot of people will say, oh, this is because in a past life they were a composer or something like that. Mm. But there are other explanations that are possible. To well, can you explain that with Mozart? Sorry, I didn't get started. Can you explain that, 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 for example, Mozart, how he could componate music so young? And um, I'll explain that as I go through these explanations. Let's summarise the explanations first, and then let's look at each one and see what other possible alternatives there might be. Yep. A feeling you've met someone before. It goes along with the good knowledge. Or deja vu. Yeah. yeah, met someone before. Yeah. Anything else that anybody can think of? Feelings, according to all your life experience. Feelings. Feelings, mm -hmm. according to. Early life, uh, oh, like a memory of your of being a baby, or a memory of being in the womb, or a memory of being born. Perhaps a memory about persons that you meet and you think that it's a person from early life. Yes, so I, wouldn't that come under some of these headings? Knowledge of things that you shouldn't have a knowledge of, or a deja vu. Yeah. The memory of passing into the spirit world. Okay, yes. That's a, that's a unique one, isn't it? So, it comes under memories, but, but of a different life. But, uh, yeah, of passing, the actual process of dying and mm. passing, yes? Yeah. It's, a, it's a very important part of this, actually, these memories that come up in people that are a process of dying. And there's a very significant reason why they come up, and we'll talk about them. Yes? Um, I always had the like trailer pictures. It would come as a clip. Yeah. I would see for like a minute. Yeah. But it always seemed I thought it was my you? past life experience, but I never saw myself in it. Right. And I would see different things happen. Just like, like you're looking out somebody else's eyes. Right. Like at yeah, an experience. And it was like a movie. Like it would play for a minute and I'd be like, oh wow, yeah. that must, I must have lived there to know that. So that would probably come under some of these things, wouldn't it? Under that heading. Memories of a different life, or pictures of a different life, knowledge of things that you don't know. But it was always like really short and really short, like stills, almost. Yeah. 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 Or movies. Uh, I had experience that when I was small. Uh, I I born in Peru, and around the age of five, I had Swedish shoes. I got Swedish shoes, the clock button, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I love them. Yeah. And at the age of 10, I got my first LP and was ABBA music. Was it Swedish, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's this Swedish connection that you don't understand. Yes, yes. personal. And then I, I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> it, it brought you here, yes? So, so when you say eight connections we don't understand. Connections we don't understand. Do we have any body contacts before we came here? Sorry, did, have we? Have we some holy contacts? You mean you have a memory of that? Me, let's say, in the spiritual world or something like that. Right. And we make some holy contacts. I want to go to this life, I want this path, so I can get on it. So there's a feeling of making a choice yeah, about so. the life you wanted. Yeah. Yes? Yep. Let's put that down. So a feeling of, shall we call them pre-human pre life choices, of pre-earth like, like we have some person, before we come to this world, we have a person and then we make a contact with him. And uh, he said, uh, you are just agreed, you're going to make it. Uh, this is not to talk too hard for you or something like that. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Uh, oh, so we call it pre-earth uh, pre life choices. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's a word called precognition. Precognition, yes. We have a lot of fortunes over us. Yeah. 
Yes. Yep. I agree. Yep. When you see a person change before your eyes. Okay. Very, very good one. So ten. Um, personality switches. Shall we call it that? And even the appearance seems to change. Where, where all of a sudden something happens and the personality switches. Yep. Good. And um, how about one like this? Uh, a lot of people uh, have observed that when a newborn child is born, sometimes um, they seem very similar to a person who's recently died in terms of their nature. Yes? Have any of you noticed that in your own family? So, so what would we call that? Uh, sim similar... Resemblance. resemblance traits, shall we call it? Resemblances? Or resemblance? A and C. See, I told you I wasn't very good in English. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a fair bit of what we would say is evidence, isn't it? Okay, so the question then becomes, well, is there alternative explanations for such evidence? Doesn't it? And with every single case there is. But, but most of us have been completely closed to the alternative explanations because of a number of emotional reasons. Now what I'm going to do is discuss the alternative explanations and then, if you wish, we can discuss the emotional reasons for each alternative explanation. Uh, in terms of, or oh, the emotional reasons for each belief. So let's start, shall we? So, I don't know if we've exhausted the reasons, I think there's probably still some more, but this covers the majority of reasons that a person would decide that they're being reincarnated or have a feeling to accept that belief. Does that make sense? Okay, I can think of a few more, um, but we'll, uh, there's enough on the board to get us started. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's look at old soul. This feeling is an old soul. Now, let's describe it. This description of that is like what Carola described earlier, which was this feeling when she was five years of age, she knew all of this stuff that nobody else knew. She'd say it, and mum and dad would look at her confused, and mostly confused because how can all this be coming out of a five-year-old? Is a, is a strong confusion. And, uh, and there's this feeling that there's all this information that comes and there's this automatic acceptance inside of the child of that information. And the child has a feeling that it knows it's true. Even though the adults around it go, what? No, that's not true. <laughs> or, or have some kind of doubt. Yeah. Okay. Now the interpretation of that for most people is, oh, oh that person is reincarnated and they have lived many lives and they know all these things now as a result of living these many lives. Yep. But there are alternative explanations. So let's look at some of them. Firstly, when this person, this child, is born, they are at their most emotionally open. They are at almost their most humble as well. You notice a child doesn't first try to work out whether it should cry before it cries. It just cries because it needs to cry. About whatever, it doesn't really matter, it just doesn't. The child is emotionally open. It's emotionally open to new experiences. It doesn't try to prevent its new experiences, except when your, its parent has some kind of fears associated with a new experience. So the child is quite open. The child is also open in its spirit body. It has the ability, through its spirit body's eyes, to see spirits. I don't know if you've ever noticed a little baby doing that, but particularly in between one, uh, two, or anywhere from newly born right the way through two to three years of age. They'll often watch things. They'll often giggle when nobody's there, even. So what are they seeing? Well, they're actually seeing spirits. They're seeing spirits interact with them. They're watching animals who are in the spirit world also interact with them. They see these things clearly because they don't have the emotional impediment of closing down their spirit body in preference to their physical body. 
So children have a huge openness to seeing spirits, conversing with spirits, listening to spirits, and relaying information from spirits. Now, if you think about it, that explains a lot of these things <laughs> automatically. Right? Because now that I'm open to a spirit, I have the ability to, to actually say things and hear things that are way beyond my own learning experience. Right? And, and if the spirit is also projecting at me a feeling of this is true, this is a certainty, the child, as you know from children, they're very open to believing anything that they feel the adult feels is a certainty. Like many of you have grown up feeling certain things are certain and then you realise when you're an adult that your mum or your dad didn't know what they were talking about and, and you had to change your opinion. But you, when you were a child, you accepted it without question, automatically, because of the emotion of the parent. You automatically accept things without question. This is what is happening here. There are literally billions and billions of spirits who are constantly surrounding us on the earth plane. Billions of spirits. There are more spirits on earth than there are people on earth. Many of you in New Age circles have called them earth bound, referring to the darker ones. But there's not just dark spirits. There's just all sorts of spirits. Normal people who have passed who still have an interest of what goes on on earth. There are also, for every single person, generally there is a guardian, a person who is invested and asked by God to protect your physical life as much as they are able, given the laws involved, and that guardian is there to give you information about how you can make your life safer. There, almost every single person on earth also has a guide of some kind. A person or a group of persons who are associated with you, trying to connect with you and guide you spiritually in discovering more spiritual knowledge. These guides exist and are surrounding most people. When I say most, usually it's the people who desire for it. In other words, they start investigating truth that guides are assigned to. So if you start investigating Catholicism, for example, then you'll probably be assigned a guide to help you investigate because that, that form of religion. Yes? If you um, uh, want to investigate the Muslim faith or the Hindu faith or New Age philosophy or any other form of investigation, a guide will be assigned to you who knows things about that form of investigation. They don't know all the truth, they just know about the thing you're passionate about. If you're a scientist and you want to investigate things to do with radioactivity, then you'll have a guide come and actually help you through this process of investigating that form of scientific endeavour. It happens in every aspect of our life. Political, economic, social, scientific, mathematical, personality, everything is all involved in these assignments that occur. Now, if we are very open to receiving their information, we will very rapidly absorb whatever it is that we are interested in because not only do we have a teacher on earth a lot of times teaching us something but we have a teacher who's with us all the time in spirit prompting us and actually dropping thoughts into our mind and so forth to help us discover more and more about that particular endeavour. Children are the most highly susceptible to this form of teaching. It's a form of teaching. It's not control, it's a form of teaching, a form of learning. And so, many times a person like a guide or a guardian or some other person who's very interested in a child will drop very fascinating things that the person themselves has discovered through the course of their life in the spirit world and they're helping the child, not only helping the child by, by dropping these thoughts into the child's mind to help the child accept those particular thoughts, but they're also helping the parents because the child then can say things that the parents feel, whoa, where did that come from? And then respond to such things and start to investigate where that came from. What, why did my child say that amazing thing? Something's going on. 
and it actually causes parents to actually question what is happening spiritually. So there's a big reason why this occurs. It's all to do with God's love, actually, teaching people as best that they are able to learn. And we are able to learn when we're a child very, very rapidly. Much more rapidly than what most of us have had the opportunity to learn because we have so many impediments on earth to learning, whereas within the spirit world there are less impediments to learning because we are far more open about the discovery of new truth. The emotions are less. Yeah? Uh, this guys, what is the difference between guys and angels? And if, uh, it's all about definition. So, so what I would call an angel and what another person calls an angel is very different. What I call an angel is a person who has become at one with God. Right? And sometimes we have referred to these in the spirit world as angels. They are all people who used to live on earth, but have gone through this process of uh, progression of their soul development in life, to the point where they've become at one with God, and after that point they're an angel. That's my definition. Right? Below this point, below the seventh dimension and the seventh dimension itself, and there are people who know things, but they are not yet at one with God. Now, if they're in the seventh dimension, they know a lot of things, compared to if they're in the second dimension, they know very little. Right? In comparison. But a person in the second dimension in the spirit world knows far more than what most people here on earth know. And so therefore it is still the person who can be listened to and engaged with. Yes? But, but they know far less than a person in the seventh dimension. Now, many people on earth call any spirit who is brighter than them an angel. But it's not very hard to get brighter than the average person on earth for a spirit because the average person on earth is in the first dimension. So it just needs to be a person in the second dimension and they would be then classified as an angel. The problem is, is if we listen to them when they're from the second dimension and many of them don't even know they're from the second dimension. Right? So, so many of them, unless they become right up near here somewhere, the fifth or sixth dimension, many of them don't know. And you can actually ask many of them and they'll say, oh, I'm from the 18th dimension. And then when you start discussing with them what they actually know, you realise, actually, not in the 18th dimension. I've just bring a bright spirit here to talk with us. What, what sphere does he say you're in? And they go, ah, oh, the first dimension. <laughs> and they, they've made 18 transitions in the first dimension, and they think that they're in the 18th dimension. Does that make sense? But they're still in the first dimension. So, so what a spirit tells you is very, very different to what is truth. Right? There's this uh, sort of this understanding on earth that if a person in the spirit world passes then they automatically know all truth and that all spirits that pass know all truth and that's not true. In fact, it's de very definitely not true yeah, which, and it can be proven um, just by interacting with the spirits themselves. So does that explain old soul? How the feeling of an old soul comes about? So, Corolla, you have a spirit with you who fed you all of this information. And you have a very strong connection with this spirit. And now you even view the spirit as yourself. You actually, you're, you are finding it very hard to differentiate between your own thoughts and the spirit's thoughts. Now, my suggestion is to start talking to that spirit. So, ask them their name. Ask them why they're with you. And they've been with you all of your life, so they're obviously a guardian or a guide. And, and often on earth what we do is we, we start thinking it's us. Because we want to think it's us. Because we, we love to think that we know more than other people. <laughs> and so we want to think that all this information comes from ourselves. And, and my suggestion is engage the spirit, talk to the spirit, and you'll find that your spirit is your friend, who's been with you all of your life, and he wants to guide you spiritually and you'll get to know their name and their character and their personality and you'll start to be able to separate your thoughts from their thoughts. And, you, and you'll even be able to have a dialogue with them. It's like having a permanent mate 
who follows you around everywhere because they like to follow you around everywhere because they want to do that job, that's part of their desire. And, uh, and it's lovely to engage them. Does that make sense? So rather than thinking it's you, start engaging them. Start talking to them. As a, because they are a different person to you. And engage them and talk to them. And let them tell you their story, their life. Their life on earth, different life than yours. Ask them why they're attracted to you. Why are they with you? Why have they been saying these things? What's happening? Ask them. And they will tell you because you can hear them because you hear them every single day of your life and you think it's your own thoughts. Does that make sense? So as soon as you start questioning that and you start looking at what's actually happening, you'll find they'll tell you about their life, they'll tell you about their interests, they'll tell you about their life in the spirit world. You can find out a lot of very fascinating things this way. Um, this telling because um, I, I can see what's happened. Mm -hmm. When you turn me off, I can feel it's not me. Yep. Right in the moment you said. Yep. Uh, what do I do with that information? I know what's happened. It's, a, it's, a, it's different. It's female and male. Yes, so you have two with you? Yeah, that I feel, uh, that's really me. Yep. Because one has uh, died in, in shock. Yeah. I just told her that I know yeah. that I killed him shot uh, in, uh, with, in Napoleon time. Yes, yes. So what do I do while I have listening? Well, you see, yeah, they're not trying to tell you that information to make you feel like oh, you've got to do something for them now, because they are well developed. The reason, what demonstrates that they are well developed, is that they have been helping you through your life with spiritual things all through your life. So that tells me that they're well developed, and I can feel them, of course, and see them. So you know, they feel and see look like they're well developed in that they're quite bright and they understand many things. So um, they're telling you this so that you can get to know them. And usually what a spirit does is firstly tell you how they died. Right? Um, because that was their most traumatic event generally on the earth for many of them, particularly during the old ages, the dark ages. And so they will tell you generally how they died. And that's one way of you getting to know them. Ask them about the rest of their life. <laughs> You know, engage them in this process of discovery. You see, they know your life because they've been sitting on your shoulder all your life. They, they know your life better than you know your life because half the events in your own life you tried to forget and they remember them all. <laughs> right? So, so they know much more about you than you know about them. Allow yourself to get to know them. Allow yourself to engage and, uh, and get to know everything about them. There have been people that have been helping your whole life. And it's, this is wonderful. Like I feel it's wonderful to get to know them. Get to, you, you know you've got a friend that you can talk to at any time and interact with at any time, even if there's no people around you. You, you can relate to these people. They can also give you, uh, provide you with information about your life. Um, now, you've got to be careful that you don't become addicted to that and just do that. And I feel these spirits that are with you are of high enough development where they won't boss you around and tell you what to do, except when they feel your life is threatened. And then they will definitely be quite firm with you. <coughs> and so the, the, the key for you is just to talk to them about this and get to know them. Yeah? And uh, perhaps if we have an opportunity during the week sometime, we might help you in that process of getting to know them. Yeah? Uh, so so the, the beauty of getting to know them is that uh, you will understand them, they, will under you, they obviously understand you quite well, but you will come to understand them. You'll also come to see the difference between the thought they drop in your mind to your own thought. The feeling they have about you compared to the feeling you have about yourself. You'll see the difference between those two things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you understand this old soul feeling is all related to their experience. They are you know, they, they have lived much longer than you have. They've had a different experience to yourself. And so therefore, they, uh, they know things that you don't know, obviously. And the key is that they've been telling you these things most of your life, and you've just accepted them as coming from somewhere, but you haven't been sure where. Now you know where. Does that make sense? And they're going, <laughs> Aren't they? They're very happy that you... 
See, you see, what happens on earth is um, because we assume that we are them, they go, no, 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 no. <laughs> they're trying to say, no, 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 you're not me, you're not me, I'm with you. You know, I'm, I'm try they're trying to connect with you as a person, and you're trying to say, but, oh, but you're me, I must have had the past life, and I must have done this, and I must have done that. But, but the reality is that then they're going, oh, no, no, not the past life thing again. Because honestly, <laughs> millions of the spirits who help you feel this way. Trust me. Like I've been a spirit at one point who helped people on earth, and I understand the feelings involved. And, and they go, oh, no, not the past life regression thing again, not the past life experience thing. No, oh, now she's believing on me, like, oh. <laughs> And, and in the process, they, they have less connection with you. Because, because now you sort of see yourself as them and so forth, and it's quite you know, confusing for yourself generally. But also, it's difficult for them to relate to you now because your beliefs are not the same as their belief system. They stay with you because they love you, but, but they can't relate as closely. If you allow the spirits to relate to you, then you can discuss things with them. Does that make sense? Yeah. And now that you can discuss things with them, it's wonderful. Like you, you've got this ability to absorb a lot more knowledge and a lot more information as a result. Where else? Like, may I also, uh, I also like to have a garden in regard to that. What should I do? You already have one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the difference between yourself and Corolla is that she has had contact with them from a very young age, and as a result, she's remained open to the connection. Does that make sense? Yeah. And as a result of her openness, and her, her family didn't close it down. Her family didn't judge her so much. They just go, whoa, what's coming out of Corolla's mouth again? <laughs> like, and, but, but it was almost like a wonder, wasn't it, with your family sometimes. Whereas with, with most other families, it's not like that at all. What happens is they hear something coming out of the child's mouth and they condemn it. And they judge it and they oppress the child. And the oppression of the child causes huge damage to your connection with your guide. All of you have guides that you can connect to. All of you have guardians you can connect to. Right? The problem we face is that we don't connect because of fears and other emotions relating to both parents. So if you think about what your parents feel about you being involved in spirituality. For many of you, your parents would condemn it. They feel you're stupid. They think, or even you come along to listen to a guy who calls himself Jesus, is pretty stupid, right? If you actually disclosed it to them. Many of you haven't even done that. Um, and that displays the level of fear that we have with our own parents and their belief systems. It's our fear of our parents' belief systems that causes us to shut down to the reality of life. And the reality of life is that every single one of us has the ability to communicate with spirits and, and have an interaction with them. Every single one of us. And every single one of us has a guardian and every single one of us has a guide we can communicate with. But it will take time for many of us to develop that relationship because it's been shut down for so long on our end. Yeah, because of our fear and other emotions that we have. And particularly the fear of our parents. It's actually very often relate, very much often related to the fear of other people's judgment of us. But is meditation good or how accurate? Yes, meditation, but focused meditation. Not just generalised meditation that you know just makes you feel calm and peaceful, but focused meditation where you're actually allowing yourself to meditate and allowing pictures to come into your mind and allowing and, and having a desire to communicate with your guide. And you will find that there will be bits and pieces initially come through that connection and eventually as you become more comfortable with such a connection and release the emotions that are the impediment to being comfortable, the connection will strengthen. Is it the same the whole time, the same guardian? No, your guardian and your guardian is often the same throughout your entire life. Uh, but your guide is often different. Mm -hmm. It depends on your passions and desires as to who is assigned as your guide. So, you, you know, if you, like I said earlier, if you're passionate about religion, then you might be assigned some guides who know a lot about religion. If you're passionate about science, then you might be assigned some guides who know a lot about scientific matters. So it just depends on where your passions are 
as to what direction you will follow. May I ask a personal question? And if it relates to the subject, certainly. Yes, it is the subject. Yeah. About the guy. Yeah. I, I was a tour leader in Germany, and, and all my guests was on a boat. Yeah. And I had given them the wrong time. I was in a, in, in a, in a, a shop buying cakes. And suddenly I hear my own voice say, I don't want any cakes. And I start to run down to the boat. Yeah. And every guest was standing because I, I gave them the wrong time. Yeah. And we are going from Germany to Earth, right? so it was a big thing. Yeah. Well, it could have been a, a, a guardian there. Yes, what often happens with our guides or guardians is they, if they notice that uh, we've made a mistake or that we've, uh, our mistake has affected other people in some way, they will often try to influence us to get things back on track. Mm -hmm. so, so they will often influence with information or with feelings to, to actually do something to get us back on track. And often if we have a connect, at, at the time then we are the most emotional, that is the time when also, ironically, most of the time we're the most open. And they can even say things through us at that time. And then we go, whoa, where did that come from? And it was actually our spirit with us saying those things through us because it, it, you know, just getting us started on the road to fixing things up. Have any of you been in an accident? Mm -hmm. Like a fairly severe accident? Uh, close to. Have any of you in that moment uh, had it was sort of almost like a second, a sec, a, you know, sixth sense that something was going got, to go wrong. Yeah. I got pushed yeah. And you get pushed or yeah. pulled or mm -hmm. yeah. all of a sudden you turn and you don't know why or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's your guardian influencing your physical body to do something to get yourself out of a tricky situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. To keep you alive. You know, his role is to keep you alive. What is intuition then? Intuition is often, um, in, in most of the time, it is the, the promptings of your guardian or guide dropping thoughts into your mind just at the right time to help you. Now they try to help you with all aspects of your life. So, so you know, you might be writing a thesis for a university degree and all of a sudden you get this, wow, inspiration, you know, there you go. Like, and and uh, this is a time when you're connected with your guide and they're uh, able to feed you information so that you can more easily do something. And uh, there are other times you, you, you might be driving along sedately and all of a sudden you feel like, oh, I need to go up this road, I don't really know why, but you follow the intuition and lo and behold, you meet a friend that you've been looking for all day and, and you see them there. And you think, oh, that's, some, that's amazing, like I just turned up there. And that's again your, your guardian or your guide, they knew that they were there and they just influencing you to turn and go up there so that, so that you can meet up because that's what you wanted. <laughs> and so, yeah, there's all those things that keep on happening. Yes? Can they also affect the car if it's like going to crash, but in the last seconds don't crash? Uh, it depends on how powerful they are as yeah. to how they can affect the vehicle. They need to have a fair degree of personal power before they can move objects larger than you. Um, and yes, they are capable of doing so. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. yeah this week we have a word we call it more, chance. And I don't know what it is. Guts. 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 A gut feeling. Like a gut feeling, yes? Yeah, gut feelings are very dominantly spirits influencing you to believe or think or feel potentially a certain thing. So, you know, hey, sometimes somebody's talking to you and you get a gut feeling that they're not probably telling you the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, that's a gut feeling that a spirit is usually said. Now, the spirit may be wrong too, by the way. <laughs> like, the person might be telling the truth and the spirit might just not like the person. <laughs> you, you understand? So, you see, they have personality too. And remember, in the first year, in particular, they have antagonistic emotions. And so they might be going, yeah, I don't like this person. <laughs> this person reminds me of my mother. You know, like, and so they don't like them automatically, and then they cause you to feel like you don't like them for some reason. Yeah? And because you've got problems with women, let's say, they can cause you to then feel that, uh, I don't really trust this woman. You know? Even though that woman might be perfectly trustworthy. Yeah? So, so spirits in the lower dimensions can influence you in lots of different ways like that. Yeah. Giving you feelings, feelings like that. Katarina? So it's really up to them to decide if they 
like anyone in these spheres can yeah. just come down any time to Earth and do whatever they want to do. Yes, with one caveat. Okay. Yeah. Your condition prevents damage. Okay. So, so if you're open to the influence, then yes, they can influence you. If you're not open to the influence, then they cannot influence you. If you're open to the influence in a negative direction, and the spirit's trying to influence you in a positive direction, then they probably won't be able to influence you. <laughs> but if you're open to influence in a positive direction, and they're trying to influence you in a negative direction, then they won't be able to influence you probably. It just depends on the amalgamation of the conditions, of the emotions, of, between yourself and the spirits involved as to how they will influence you. Yeah. So, when you are angry, many dark spirits can influence you in your rage. Have you noticed that sometimes? You get into anger, anger is one thing where you can feel it's your own anger, and then all of a sudden you just come into this white fury type of place, right? that doesn't even feel you, but you're yelling and screaming and words are coming out of your mouth that are really, really hurtful. And you, like, you see this happen frequently. Words coming out of your mouth that are really hurtful. And just seemingly targeted perfectly to harm the person. Yeah? And then when it all stops, you go, what did I do? Mm -hmm. Many of you have had that experience? That's a spirit overtaking you in the moment of your anger. And taking it further, because there's quite a dark spirit now influencing that. And many of you have had experiences where, um, many of you have been drunk, yes? <laughs> and have had experiences where you can't remember drinking anymore. You can't even remember anything, but you still keep drinking. You still stay end upright and can keep, keep shoveling it down. And you can't remember getting home. And, and sometimes, I, I, I knew some people when I was at, at university, who can't, couldn't even, they wake up on Monday morning, they couldn't remember the entire weekend. They wake up Monday morning in a bed that's not their own, in a house they've never seen before. And how did all that happen? Right? And that all happened because the spirit overtook them at the place of drunkenness, and, and then from then on motivated them to keep drinking and have an experience. Right? Now, some have woken up with somebody next to them in their bed, <laughs> and all sorts of things have happened in that place, and that is often very heavily spirit-influenced by these darker spirits. And once we become drunk, we have less of an impediment to the influence. So it's an automatic thing that they can, they can take over us far more easily once we become drunk. This is why, on Earth, there is a huge problem with drunkenness, because there is this desire for people on earth to get away from their sadness and so they drink but once they start drinking spirits can hook into the process and keep you drinking and once they keep you drinking they can keep you drinking beyond the point of drunkenness now where you pass out yourself you pass out but but they can keep your body functioning and upright and doing things with your body and it's exactly the same with things like schizophrenia and manic depression these two so-called illnesses are heavily spirit influenced. Why do spirits do that? Because in the spirit world, there's no drink, there's no alcohol. So the only way they can get the feeling of being drunk is by connecting to a person who is drunk and sharing the experience. That's the only way they can feel that sensation. They have a lot of sadness to do that, but they also are trying to avoid their emotions quite substantially. And so they choose to do that. Yeah? And so they heavily influence the person uh, in that place to continue drinking and so forth. Yeah. So, uh, if a person is very, very, very sad, it's also attacked by dark spirits. Uh, no, if a person doesn't believe in God, he can go very, very, very low and attract very, very dark spirits. Yes, but it's not the sadness that causes the attraction, but the avoidance of the sadness. You see, if you're prepared to experience all of your own emotions, then you won't attract those spirits. It's only when you're sad that you don't want to feel sad that causes the attraction. It's the same with every emotion. So if you truly own your own emotion, then it's very hard for you to ever be influenced. But, but most of us on earth don't want to own our own emotion, so what we do is we try to avoid our own emotion 
and that's when we're more easily influenced. Yeah? It's our avoidance that causes us to be more easily influenced. Now, can you see I've answered pretty much that question as an alternative? It's up to you to decide what the alternative is. From Carola's experience, she can now speak to the spirits involved, so she knows that probably what I'm saying is true, but you'll have to trust her assessment of that. Let's rub that one out. Past life regression. What I've described is spirits often give you information about their life when they try to connect to you. Darker spirits do it because they want help. There's many spirits in the spirit world who are in this first dimension who are constantly coming to earth looking for brighter people, people who look brighter in their body, and they, they go, well, if they're brighter, they must know more than I do. There's this feeling right, that they have, that they must know more than I do. So they hang around you. And what they do is they hang around you, and, and when you have quiet moments or times of meditation or other kind, you know, where you're open to their influence, they will drop pictures into your mind to try to tell you about their life. Because they want help from you. Right? They want assistance from you. They want to get out of the condition they're in. Many spirits want this. And so they drop things into your mind, wanting you to help them. They don't often even understand how you can help them. They just realise that there's something different between you and them. And they also can see many times that you can talk to spirits or hear them, even though you might not be conscious of that. And so what they do is they want <coughs> assistance from you. <coughs> they want assistance from you. Or they want to overcloak your life. And so this is a malevolent spirit now. We we'll want to overcloak your life so that he can re-experience his earth life. So, so the more of a connection he has with you, and the more you think you're him, he now has stronger control over you. And the stronger the control, the more he can experience life through you. Right? And so many spirits do this as well. So some of them are what I would call malevolent, where they purposefully do this. Others are what I would call neutral, where they don't want to harm your life, and they're not trying to make you think you're somebody else other than you are, or anything like that. But instead what they're trying to do is get some assistance from you, because they believe that you can help them some way. Now, unfortunately, most people on Earth, when they have one of these experiences, and they believe they are the person. <clears throat> and that negates, for the, for the spirit who's trying to get help, they get frustrated with that, and they go on to another person, <laughs> and try to get help from another person. For the, for the spirit that's malevolent, or, or trying to connect, cause this connection, he loves it. Or she loves it because it gives her now more control of you. She can or he can drop thoughts into your mind, get you to do things because you think it's all part of this past life that you've had. Okay? And it's a very damaging thing that they're doing to you, and their condition darkens as they do it. They actually get into a worse condition by doing this. But unfortunately, it has the effect often of pulling down the condition of the person on earth as well. Right? Because the person on earth starts doing things that they wouldn't have normally done because of the influence. So how do you protect yourself? This sounds really heavy, what you have been talking about. I mean, if you're not in, in love, truth and humility and... Uh, you're just doing your best, and all this happens around you. What are your chances? And your chances are really good. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. Yeah. laughs> now, now, first, can I state? Every time you feel heavy, it's because of an emotion you feel, of fear. Right? I'm not trying to make you feel afraid. I'm just telling you the truth of life on earth, and life in the spirit world. That's all I'm doing here. I'm not trying to make you feel afraid. However, it's important you know the truth. Love, truth and humility are the simplest of things for you to develop. And so when you stay in these places, it's very hard for a spirit to have a long-term effect over you. 
It's only when you try to avoid your emotions, which is a lack of humility, avoid the truth, in other words, believe things that are false, or don't want to act in harmony with love, that now spirits can have a huge effect on your life. So you can often in the course of the day swing between those two places. So you might wake up in the morning feeling really great. Who wakes up in the morning feeling great? Oh, excellent. <laughs> I'm impressed. So this is very good. So you wake up in the morning feeling great. In that place you're much closer to love, truth and humility. Highly likely, highly likely that you have less influence on you. You can make choices and decisions quite easily, and so forth. And then during the day, something might happen, like a negative event. Like, let's say your boss gets angry with you and raises their voice towards you. In that place, you will feel some fear, maybe, and maybe some anger. Right? Now, there's the potential, if you don't choose to feel it, in other words, if you're not humble, if you don't choose to feel it, now there's a potential for a spirit to influence you at that moment in time. Does that make sense? Just at that moment in time, until you're over that moment, emotionally over that moment. If you feel the feelings you have, then the spirit cannot influence you. That's how it works. So it's actually quite simple to protect yourself from their influence. But unfortunately for most people, we're not humble enough to feel our own feelings. And so what we finish up doing is getting ourselves in a position where we're often overcloaked for long periods of our life. And in the last group I did in England, 45% of the audience were permanently overcloaked. In other words, they lived their entire life at the whim of the spirits that are with them. Right? They do everything the spirits with them tell them to do. There was one lady, when she asked me a question up the back, I looked into her eyes and her entire eyes went black while she was asking the question, and she asked one question, and I started to answer the question, then she, she didn't hear anything I was saying at all, she started to ask another question, I listened for that question to its end, then I started to answer that question, and then she didn't hear any answer again, she went on to a third question, and then by the third question I'm going, no, the spirit's had enough now, so I addressed the spirit instead of her, right, so I talked to the spirit instead of her, and she went instantly silent. The spirit just instantly went silent because it's the first time that spirit had ever been caught out as influencing her in her entire life. I feel sorry for her and the persons around her because they had no idea of who she really is. She's actually just the personality of the spirit. Basically. Being like that all her life. And um, we had another person, he was asking some questions down the front, and it was just bombarding one after the other without giving any chance to answer any of the questions, and he was just going over and going over, and he went on for nearly 20 minutes, um, and eventually I just said, look, um, you're being unloving now, the whole audience was sick and tired of him to be frank, and I said, you're being unloving now, you need to stop. He, he wouldn't stop, he just kept going, kept going, kept going. What happened was I asked him to leave, he walked out of the, the room, he walked straight across the road into a pub, and a man who was drinking in the pub and who was now drunk, walks, walks 15 minutes later across the road and into the audience. And the same spirits were with that man, with the man that just left. And he started doing the same thing that this man started doing. And then he came up during the break, I was fairly patient with him and he allowed it to go on for a bit and he, we were just before a break. He came up during the break, all drunk, and he was telling me how this other man was dealt unfairly with, uh, the man who had been asked to leave. And instead I spoke with the spirits and then with him about that issue. And then he goes, no worries mate, and off he went back to the pub. <laughs> well, these events happen all the time where people are influenced, right? one after the other, after the other, you have events going on from all the time like that. Could you see that it was the same spirit? Yeah, yeah, and also the man's demeanour was exactly the same. The second man was a completely different personality, but exactly the same demeanour as the first man. Yeah. So what about this group here now? You've talked about the last <laughs> group. <laughs> <laughs> How about our spirits here? There are many influences upon you spiritually, yes. 
And some of you, and those of you who have believed that you were reincarnated, actually have very strong connections to spirits. And you have very strong, many of you have very strong connections, not just to one, but to many <coughs> spirits that are with you. Now some of those spirits are with you because they want to utilise you to get what they want done back on the earth. Others are with you because of this other reason that I mentioned, that they're confused. They don't know, and so they're with you because they can see you're investigating truth, so they're trying to investigate truth through you, right? And they're connecting with you to do that. So there are many reasons why the spirits come to you. They're not just all malevolent. They're not all just nasty. There's a lot of ones that are not nasty at all. They're investigative. They, they want to know. They want to learn. They're trying to learn along with you. And so they cause you to... But, but in their connection, they're also giving you pictures and thoughts. They're giving you movies even of their life. Yes? Movies of their life pass to you and all of a sudden you go, whoa, that was a, whoa, that's a bit hard to handle. And a, a lot of times it's about their death. And many of their deaths are sometimes traumatic. And so sometimes you feel it as a traumatic experience. And, uh, and then you assume, oh, maybe that's me. Maybe that's me in a past life. And uh, for some of the spirits, they like you thinking that. But for the others, some of the others, they go, no, 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 it's not you. It's me. You know, I, I'm the one that needs help. You know, you're not dead yet. You know, like, because many of them have died and they've arrived in the hells of the spirit world needing help. And they don't know how to get help. Does that make sense? They've got no idea how to get help. They've got no idea about brighter spirits even. That they can't even see them. It's like they're blind to seeing brighter spirits. And you sometimes have to introduce them. Right? So many of the times we've talked with spirits, we've introduced the, the dark spirits who need help to a bright spirit who can help them. And sometimes that's all you have to do. And then the dark spirit goes, no worries, I'm off. And off he goes with the bright spirit to try to work through things, you see. And so sometimes it's, these spirits are not malevolent, but rather looking for answers, looking for truth, just like we are. Yes. And so and many of us in the audience have a, co have a combination of those kind of spirits around us. A malevolent spirit trying to influence you negatively, and then other spirits who are not malevolent, who are just trying to uh, get truths from you or sh share the experience. And then there's other experiences like your guide or your guardian who are trying to look after you, protect you and lead you in a certain direction. So it's like you are constantly surrounded by a group of mates, some of which, some of which are not so good mates and some of which are pretty good mates. Like, I used to say, me and all my heads. So <laughs> yes. Got, it's a feeling of this. And often that is the feeling that we have, that it's me and all these different people who are stuck in here somewhere. And that is often the case, yeah. often the case, and so we then start thinking that we've had all of these past lives, which doesn't help the situation. It actually hinders the situation, because it causes us to believe something that's false, when if we accepted the truth, we'd be able to interact on a more personal level with every single one of those persons, because they are just people, right? That's the beauty of understanding the truth, is that you start understanding that every single person who comes to you is just a person. Yeah. So do you think I've covered that? Now, can I just say about past life regression? You have past life regression therapists, yes? This is a very dangerous profession, to be frank. The reason why is because the person who's a therapist has thousands of spirits around them constantly, waiting to experience their life through another person on earth. And when you go to this therapy, you are opening yourself up to that spirit influence by following the directions of the therapist. It's a very, very dangerous thing these, these therapists are doing without understanding what they're doing. Now this is why I, I've seen therapists take literally hundreds, have hunts, one person, like one individual comes to their place hundreds of times, and each time they come they have a video of the different person they became. Right? Now that is just one spirit after another spirit after another spirit taking an opportunity to connect to a person on earth. Now, if it was done to connect to the spirit and explain to the spirit what was going on, then that, that would be great. So if it was done to help the spirit somehow to progress, that would be fantastic. But unfortunately it's not done for that reason. It's done to do some kind of therapy 
And to be frank, any therapy involving past life regression is severely flawed because in the moment of the overcloaking, the person has now absconded from their, they've now exited their body. And so you're not dealing with the person who walked in the door anymore, but you're dealing with the spirit who is now overcloaking them. So you might help the spirit, but you're not going to help the person. But this is one reason why many of the spirits surround the past life regression therapist, because they want help. So that they see this as an opportunity to get some help, even though the therapist doesn't really know what's happening and they think it's a past life, and the spirit can often help get help. That's why many of the spirits do not return after the first visit. So they have the experience, they get the help they wanted, and then they leave. And they don't come back, some of them. Many of them don't come back. Uh, so they don't repeat. Yeah. It's true also, isn't it, that often the spirits are trying to work through the trauma of their actual passing through yes. experience, having it expressed through another person. And yes. Yeah, so it's not really healthy for anyone because it's sort of... Um, well, it's healthy for the spirit, but, but only if it's understood what, they're what the situation and yeah. what they're trying to do. Yeah, it's like... It's like, it's great if you can help a spirit understand their own passing, because then they have less trauma. So that's a fantastic thing, if you understand, you know, what's going on. But, but the person who's the channel, the person who's the person who's stepped out of their body for a while while their spirit has come into it, they're not benefiting, unless they understand what they're doing. They, they need to understand they've become a channel. They've become a medium for this process. So, but if they're understanding it, is that then a loving thing? Yes, very loving thing. Imagine, imagine what you could do. You could actually talk to each person who's traumatized in the spirit world, who's still in the dark place, and actually help them progress from a dark place to a light place. Yep. There's some wonderful books on this subject that have been written. Um, there was one that we've got on the website and on the disc. It's called 30, 30 Years Amongst... The Death. And it's actually a story about a man who was a doctor in the 1920s and 30s and his wife who was a medium. And what they used to do, the pair of them used to look at um, physical and problems of people on earth that were uncurable by any other doctors. And they, what they used to do is they knew that every time there was a spirit or more than one spirit involved, and what they used to do was give the patient a very small electric shock that the patient couldn't feel, but that but spirits are very sensitive to. The spirit would exit the body of the patient, and then the wife of the doctor, she was a medium, she would allow the spirit to enter her. And then the spirit, the doctor, would talk to the spirit through his wife. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in the process of talking, they've, they've got literally hundreds of experiences in this book, it's three or four hundred pages long. And literally hundreds of experiences of the, the discussions that went on and what the cure was for the patient and what happened to the spirit. Yeah. Very interesting book to understand what's going on. You, you start, when you read a book like that, you start understanding a lot about past life regression and, and personal people's even people's physical sicknesses, most of them, many of them are caused by spirits or spirit overcloaking. And you start understanding the relationship between the spirit's energy and what's going on emotionally for the person in that book. It's a really good book. It's on the website and, and it's also on the disc that we've been giving out. And have we, we've also at home got um, the data discs, haven't we? But we haven't got any of them here, I don't think. Katerina, you didn't bring any data discs with you, did you? I bought one. You bought one. So, um, on, on the website, the Divine Truth website, um, there's a, the, the, the person to search, there's persons to search through, and it's Dr. Uh, Carl Wickland, I think it is. You'll find it under, on the website. It's a 300 page PDF, or <coughs> but it is worth reading. If you're do you search in mediums, I think, Sorry? Do you search in medium? Yeah, it's under, under resources, mediums, I think. Um, Dr. Carl Whitler, you'll find it as a book that you can download. 
And the reason why I tell you these things is because this will help you understand this process of past life regression and it will also help you understand the relationship between physical illnesses and <coughs> spiritual issues because there is a strong relationship between those two particular things. Um, when I sort of feel or see really um, handicapped or <coughs> you know, disabled people, yep. like there's just a spirit there that's just like... Crunching. Yeah, yes, like yeah, yeah. grabbing and just like... Yeah. This is what's happening to yeah, Daniel. Yeah, well, I saw moment. that yesterday yes. too. But yeah. felt, he kind of felt like he had to hold on to him or he'd lose him or something. Yes, yes. Happened. The like, emotion coming from the spirit is he's trying to protect them. Yeah, and but it's not just go, one spirit. Yeah. It's actually a group of women and men yeah. that are just hugging around him, trying to protect him from what they feel is going to be attack. There's no proof of the attack. There's just feel yeah. of the attack. And they are familial spirits, they are ancestral spirits, and they are connected because of some of mum's emotions. Yeah. Um, and but part of mum's emotions are about wanting men to protect her and make her feel safe and secure, and needing strong boys, it's a feeling around you of, uh, of wanting strong men around you who love you and care about you. And there's a strong need for that, and this leaves your son Daniel open to this kind of influence. Myself and Mary talked to the spirits this morning, um, who were influencing Daniel, and uh, they didn't even know that they were having a physical effect on his body. They, 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 now they, they looked at, we discussed the physical effects that they were having on his body, and he, they are affecting his brain, the mylar in his brain. They are also affecting his central nervous system down his spinal column. And, and they didn't, they didn't realise they were affecting him so much. They thought they were protecting him. Mm. Yeah. But now that we've discussed that, they are now considering it. That considering it would be the best way to say it, because they're not convinced. <laughs> they're just considering it, yes. Um, so there are things mum can do to work through those emotions which would free them of the spirit's involvement. Because um, it's always with a child, it's always mum and dad that have to work through something generally. And it's the primary caregiver generally. So you're the primary, mum's the primary caregiver. So it's mostly mum that needs to work through those things. But yes, it's but interesting. It's just always the case with the disabled. It's just because yes. the spirit's just there. Like. The spirits are just like pulling their body apart, literally, yeah. energetically and physically. They are, the spirits are actually hanging off them and drawing their life energy out of them. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, Many of you know uh, Karen, yes? Karen yeah, yeah, and yes. Mario, yes? Mm -hmm. who are in Spain at the moment, I understand. And Karen has had a very similar experience that caused her the onset of her disease. It was a spirit, a family spirit, um, who has caused the onset of her disease as well. Same kind of thing, this family spirit just got almost total control of the physical body. Very painful for the person sometimes too because they feel very constricted and constrained and quite claustrophobic through this control. So it's very uncomfortable. The spirits often think they're doing the person a favour and they're not noticing the physical effect of, on the person. Yeah, Eva? Yeah, I just wonder if Karen is an adult person, uh, it wouldn't be her mother that has to do the primary. It's primarily her emotion, yes. Yes, yes. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, I've discussed with her in Greece her emotions about that. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, so can you see, um, when Karen started to deal with this issue, she started communicating with the spirits that were with her, and she can feel the spirits that are with her and what control they have, and she can even feel the time that it began. And why it began, there was an emotional event that caused Karen to become susceptible to the spirit's influence and she could feel that she was still trying to run away from that emotional event. So, so we discussed much of these things when we were in Greece together. Yeah. So is there any more questions about past life regression? No? And um, what time is it? Half past. Half past? Five. Five? Yeah. Deja vu. Deja vu is an, in an interesting one. Because there are actually two things going on with deja, deja vu. The first thing going on is every time you go to sleep, you are still awake. <laughs> you are still having an experience. 
And in the spirit world, you meet up with many people. Many people who you've not yet met when you're on earth. You also visit many locations on earth. You actually walk around the streets on earth and do all sorts of things that you can do in your spirit body that you would be unable to do in your physical form without transportation. And so when you wake up, whenever you visit those same locations, you will have a sense of deja vu. That's because you have been there in your spirit body. Now, now what happens, let's say you're planning a trip overseas and you realise you're probably going to stay in a certain location. Well, most of us at night would go and visit that location first and check it out. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> you, know, you want to know if it's a rough neighbourhood, and, you know, if there's the restaurants around that you can eat, and is it, you know, you would want to do that, wouldn't you? So, so this is why you have sort of feeling. What is? Well, I've been here, and yes, you have been there. You've just been there in your spirit form. That's all. Does that make sense? Very simple explanation. And also, though, sometimes a spirit with you has been there. And that's the whole reason why you're visiting that location in the first place. Some of you feel drawn to visit certain locations. You asked the question earlier about why am I drawn to Sweden even though I come from Peru? Mm -hmm. yeah? And why was I wearing clogs? And why was I you know, doing all the Swedish things? And that's because there is some Swedish people with you who are influencing you to be here. Does that make sense? Yeah. And they are with you, and they are people, they are people who have passed, and they are with you influencing a bit of your life, and in, they think, you know, they... See, as a spirit, you have the ability to visit anywhere on the planet, yes? So, you might visit a place on the planet and go, Hey, she's a nice girl. I like that guy over there too. Hmm. I'll try a bit of matchmaking. <laughs> You know, if I can get her to go there and then get her to go here and him to go there, they might meet. And then when they meet, I can go, I can go, yes, he's the one. And she's the one. And then, bang, there's a relationship, right? And there are many busybody matchmakers. <laughs> I'm serious. In the spirit world. Spirits who, who have not lost this feeling of wanting to put people together they, that they like, yes? And, uh, and so they match make and they do all sorts of things, not understanding that they're actually quite severely impacting a person's personal choices in life at times. Um, now, why are we open to them? Well, there's all sorts of emotional reasons why we become open to such influence. Right? One might be that I, I want to meet my soulmate and I'm and I don't want to have to deal with any emotions to meet my soulmate. I don't want to have to live in love trees and humility to meet my soulmate. I want to meet my soulmate now. And now in that place, a spirit can easily influence your choices and decisions so that you meet the person they are suggesting to you are, is your soulmate. And they can draw you to locations and move things around in such a way to influence you, to drop little thoughts into your mind, into their mind, so that you eventually meet. Right. Now sometimes it's malevolent, sometimes they want to cause trouble, other times they're just having a bit of fun, other times they seriously think you two should meet, because they think that you would suit each other, and you have a great life. You know, that's what they feel. They're like any person on earth who has some emotions about things that they think they know, interfering with your life. Many of them are like that. Right? Now, that causes you to believe you've been somewhere before, that you've seen something before, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth, that there is just this simple explanation of spirit influence. Have we covered that? What, what about uh, when you, you say something and you just... I, I said that before and I just was in front of this person. Before. Exactly. You see, uh, oftentimes in the spirit world, when we're in our sleep state, we're having conversations with the same person that we've met previously, because uh, we met them in our sleep state, and we talk to them, and of course, we finish up talking about similar subjects, because we've got similar law of attraction that brings us together and so forth, and so we often have almost a mirror of the conversation, even, as the conversation that we had in the spirit world. Yeah. 
And there's a certain, I know you, I know you, you were going to say that, I knew that. <laughs> you know, all that kind of feeling, like, yeah. And also, when you're in the sleep state, you have ability to look forward a bit in your life. And theirs too, by the way. You have the ability, this is how some people have a premonition of their own death, for example. Because you have the ability in your sleep state to look forward in life, because there's less influence in time in the spirit world. You also have a clearer mind, so you're able to analyse events with a lot more clarity than you can on earth, and as a result can predict to a large degree of regularity, generally, what may happen to you if you make certain choices and decisions. And therefore you can get premonitions about your life, other people's lives, that you can relate to them, or feel yourself. Yeah. A lot of times it freaks people out, but it doesn't mean that if, you have a, if I have a premonition of your death, it doesn't mean you're going to die. It just means if things go on exactly as they are right now, you're probably going to die. Does that make sense? But if something changes, if you change one thing, even one emotion, you could live 100 years instead of dying at that point. point. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And a lot of these premonitions are there given to us by our, guides, uh, our guardians, in fact, to protect us. To say, if your life keeps going the way it's going, you're going <laughs> to end up like this, you know? And, and sometimes your, guide, your guides, in particular, get a bit firm with you because their, their feeling is to protect your life. So sometimes they'll get a bit firm with you and they'll make suggestions, you, you keep going how you're going and you're going to be in this trouble. You know? And that causes you to pause and go, oh, should I make that choice or should I make that decision? And that's good because they are protecting you from making unwise choices and decisions. Yeah. Any other questions about day job? Do you think I've explained it potentially as another explanation than you thought? Yeah, let's go on then. Knowledge of all things, of different things. Now, can you see from the explanations I've already given, we can almost go through a lot of these things and say it could be that same thing going on, right? This is a very interesting one, though, because, um, and because many of our spirit friends have investigated many things in the spirit world and on earth very thoroughly. They have the ability to pass knowledge and information to us as long as we're open to that knowledge and information. Now that is a wonderful thing because it means you can learn more rapidly. You can absorb information more thoroughly and rapidly if, if they do this with you. So my suggestion is allow these processes to go and determine whether they have an unloving aspect or not. So an unloving aspect would be if you chose to follow a certain path and you found that something not very pleasant happened to you as a result of following that path, then you'd have to start considering whether the spirit with you is influencing you in a positive direction, he's benevolent, <laughs> or he's influencing you in a negative direction, he's malevolent. And that allows you to make the choice and decision based on the experience. And that's what I'd recommend for many of you to try. So this, this information can be dropped into your mind as long as you are open to it. Children are very open to it. Have you noticed sometimes when you're at your wit's end as a mother, the children seem to become more unruly than they normally are? Have you noticed that? Many of you mothers, have you noticed that when you're really struggling and you feel under pressure and you feel really like, you know, like you'd really like to have some peace and quiet, that's when the children are the most rowdy. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that happens? Because at the moment you are avoiding your emotions of being overwhelmed and feeling fear, your children are more heavily influenced by negative spirits in that same moment. We have a family, some fa a friend of family in Australia, who we sit down with them for dinner and during the conversation of the dinner and the different children's interactions I describe to them which spirit is with them, what Steve's doing now, why he's doing it and so forth. It's a very interesting conversation. And what happens is that you can actually guess even who's with them. If you're not seeing the spirit, it's quite easy to even guess who's with the child and why they're with them if you feel your own emotions. And so it's worth experimenting with that one if you have children as well. Um, have I covered these?
subjects. And what's this one? This one's memories of a different life. You can understand how that can occur. Um, natural abilities. Now, natural abilities I find fascinating, you see, because unfortunately for most uh, parents, many parents have very strong emotional ties to certain forms of abilities. So, for example, a man who's living in America, in the USA, may love his son being a talented basketball or football, like gridiron star. And he might love that whole aspect of sport. This is also very common in Australia. Like, Australians love their sport. And uh, as a result, often before the child is even born, the parent wants them to follow a certain career or a certain direction. Now, because the parent is so open to that career or direction, spirits in the spirit world who used to be a person with that kind of same ability and same desire can overcloak the person at a very young age and even overcloak them if they're in the womb. They can even overcloak the child in the womb because of the openness of the parents right, towards that. Now, if that happens, the child will have a natural ability in a certain direction at a very, very young age. One, you know, by the time they can pick up a violin, they can play it. That kind of age. Two years of age, three years of age, and so forth. And most of those natural abilities um, come from this process of being overcloaked by spirits because of the emotional openness of the mother, to, and father to having such a thing occur. Now, what that does though is that it causes the person to not really know themselves very much because they, their whole life is basically shared with the spirit entity. And, uh, and when they pass, that's when they have their confusion. Almost every child prodigy who's passed has entered a state of confusion because they don't know who what is their own desires and they don't know what the spirit who's now left them desires are. You see, as soon as you pass, a spirit cannot influence you anymore using the same methods. And so the spirit connection severs immediately. And as a result of the severing, the person is left with their own feelings. And if they've hardly ever felt their own feelings, it's very confusing, as you can imagine. Now, I've talked to many spirits who have had this experience and, uh, and they uh, all describe the same level of um, internal, um, what would you call it, it's like a, it's just a terrible worry when they pass. It's not about passing, they pass fine, but after they pass, all of the same feelings they had on earth have disappeared because the spirit with them has disappeared and then they don't know who they are. And it's very, very disconcerting to the person. Now, every single... You, you know uh, the Dalai Lama? Well, this is what's happened to every Dalai Lama. Every Dalai Lama... You see this happening religiously quite frequently, where parents of a certain child consecrate the child to a certain religious faith, and in the process of doing so, have an openness to the child being overcloaked by a spirit who is of the same faith. And the Dalai Lamas of the previous generations overcloak the child. Right? And from a very, very young age, often it's within the womb they overcloak the child. And they educate the child, both in their sleep state and the awake state. And by the time the child is 10, the child is fully educated about every single part of the Buddhist path right? through this process. Yeah. And, uh, and then the rest of their life is that, and it's called succession in the spirit world. And in the spirit world, spirits cause succession. They overcloak the next generation, overcloak the next generation, and so forth, to create a continuity of a spiritual path on earth purposefully. The only problem is, when the spirit passes, it's the first, when the person on earth, I mean, passes over into the spirit world, 
it's the first time that they learn that that's actually happened to them. And that is often a very, very tricky time for them emotionally. They have to work their way through the feeling of having been controlled all of their life. And it's a very hard feeling to work their way through. So I've spoken to many Dalai Lamas as well. There are some Dalai Lamas actually who are now one with God, and, but there are others who do this, who are in different dimensions, in the sixth dimension of the spirit world. Yeah. It's a spirit's question, but they want to know, um, so isn't there a way, how does a person develop their natural abilities um, without, without being, spirit being helped by spirits? Yes. How do you get good at something? How do you get good at something? And well, it, it gets back to some very basic principles. Whenever you have a passion for something, you will generally automatically get very good at it. Right? So the key to get good at something is to actually encourage the passion. You see, what happens a lot of times here on earth is that a child has a passion in a certain direction, but because the parents don't agree with that direction, they discourage the passion. And that shuts down the child, and now the child will also be very, it'll find it very difficult to learn. But, but if the passion, the natural passion of the child is encouraged, now their natural ability will grow very rapidly. Right? The other impediment we have here on earth is that there is a, a strong focus on intellectual development and very little focus on emotional development. The problem with this is that almost everything that you can have a passion for requires your emotions. So, the problem is shutting down the intellect, uh, so, sorry, promoting the intellect and shutting down the emotion, is it causes you to not know a natural feel of something, and rather having to engage your mind to do it. Now, I don't know if you've ever spoken to any sportsman or tennis player or, you know, famous sportsman. They will, they will tell you that they get into a zone. It's the zone of their passion. And in that place, they're not even thinking about what they are doing. Like famous tennis players, for example, explain uh, that they can be playing the ball and moving towards the ball before they even think it's even going in that direction. Right? And they themselves do not even understand that. That's the time when they're playing their best. That's in the zone. And they actually go in the direction the ball's going to be hit by the other player. And they can feel the intention of the other player so strongly that they know it's going to hit in that direction. Right? And lo and behold, yes, most of the time it is hit in that direction. And, and they're already moving and they're not even hardly even conscious of their body anymore and its pains and aches. And the main reason why is because they're in their passion. When you're in your passion, you, you, you very rarely think about your body or any other thing. You're just totally in your passion is doing what you're passionate about. So the way to encourage a natural ability is to encourage passion and encourage the person to stay in their emotion rather than getting into their mind about their passion. Does that make sense? Now the problem we have on earth is that we are constantly trying to learn things with our mind. Now there's a time, I don't know if you've noticed it, have any of you picked up a guitar right from scratch? Right, the very first, do you remember that for those of you who who plays the guitar here? One, two, few, few of us, right? When did you first pick up the guitar? Sixteen. You were sixteen? Fourteen? What age? Yeah, similar yeah. similar age, sorry, okay. Um, so when you pick up the guitar and you first play it, it's very foreign, isn't it? It feels quite foreign. You're sort of having to press fingers down, coordinate. <laughs> there comes a time after a little bit of learning where it all just goes click, sort of thing, yes? Where all of a sudden, you're now no longer having to think about what you're doing. And now you're doing it automatically, yeah? This, has happened, this happens with all sorts of musical instruments later. And in that place, you are now, if you stay in that place and you stay in your passion and you're not worried and someone's not on your back whipping you and saying you've done the wrong note there and so forth, and you stay in that place, you will learn very, very rapidly from that point onwards. So the spirits who have asked that question, 
Development of natural abilities depends on two primary things. Firstly, focusing on your passion. And secondly, forgetting the intellectual side of the development and focusing on the emotional side of the development. Then your passion will grow very rapidly. In the future, we will have child prodigies that are not spirit overcloaked. In other words, we'll have five-year-olds playing the violin perfectly and to orchestra standard or beyond, uh, but not being overcloaked by a spirit. At the moment, every single one of them on earth is overcloaked by a spirit doing that. But in the future, we will not have that. Yes. Uh, there is a young American painter, I think she's around 15. Yes. Know. Yes. When she was like seven, I've seen a book with this picture. She, she painted in oil or acrylic. Yes, I've seen her paintings. We covering your Jesus face, mm -hmm. and she informed her family about God. Mm -hmm. And this was a family not talking at all about God. Mm -hmm. what, 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 was, what happened? So from what I've described, what do you think happened? So this is actually her background too. He's she has a beautiful connection with a divine love spirit God with a guide in the, uh, above the eighth, the eighth sphere. And she's had it for a long, long time because her, her parents were open to it, but her parents were also quite moral and quite religious when she, before, when she was conceived. And that created a clarity between herself and the connection with the spirit. And now she's able to communicate with the spirit seamlessly and do all sorts of beautiful like, paintings, of absolutely amazing paintings. And as a result of this connection that she has, yeah. she sees it as just a normal part of her life. Yes. Yeah, but she doesn't lose her. This is a child, so she does not because a, a, an angel or a celestial spirit wouldn't. Wouldn't. Her. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't. She doesn't. The, the celestial spirit with her does not take. Uh, <coughs> her, um, is not trying to get anything out of it. <coughs> yeah. Just, just helping the child enhance her own ability. And so she, she, for that reason, she does very well. Yeah. Yeah. Nice connection with the spirit. Yeah. So, um, what about the natural talent of teaching? Uh, um, I mean, the, the core question is, am I overcloaked of, a, of an old teacher? <laughs> and um, many of us who have taught in the past have been overcloaked by teachers who have taught in the past. It's not a bad thing because they share their knowledge through us and we can grow through the experience. Just look at just the whole thing of natural ability. The key thing to look at is your own desire. Do you feel it as your own desire or do you feel that your desire is being influenced by an external influence? Now, for many of us you'll find there's a mixture of things going on. Yeah. Sometimes it's your own desire, and then sometimes it's the desire of another influencing your desire. The key is to separate those two things, because, and, and to be frank, a person who's helping you from the seventh sphere or above, they will not want to control your life. They will assist you in your life without controlling your life. A spirit who's in the sixth sphere or below may wish to influence your life and even control your life, and... If they get the ability to do so, they will often regularly take it. Mm -hmm. And so the key you've got to ask yourself at any point in time is, is, does this feel like me or does it feel like I'm outside of me? Am I connected <coughs> with me or am I not connected with me? What's going on? And especially when somebody has the emotion of wanting to be told what to do. Yes. There's a very dangerous emotion from a, from a person's perspective on earth. If you have an emotion on earth where you like being told what to do because you don't want to take personal responsibility for your choices, you will attract very many spirits around you, influencing every single choice and decision you make. We have a friend in Australia who we met only a few years ago, and when I met him, I could feel that the spirits with him wanted to kill him within two weeks. Uh, and he had abdicated everything about his own life. He would do whatever they said to do. So he, got, he would get up in the morning and he would go, he would have this spiritual practice where he got up every morning and he would go, what do you want me to do? And he believed it was good. And they would tell him to do this and to do that and to do this and he would do only those things during the day. 
Yes. So they tell him to leave his wife and family. So what does he do? He just gets up one day and packs his bag and leaves them. Yes? Imagine the hurt of the family. Yeah. And of course they've still not forgiven him for it. Right? Because it's taken him two years to realise that he was actually told to leave the family. Yeah? They were telling him to do all sorts of things with his car. They were telling him to do all sorts of things with his day-to-day -day life. And, and within two weeks he was going to die if he continued doing what he was doing. Anyway, we had a chat about this. And we talked about the imperative for him to start taking responsibility for his own life. Now, as soon as he did that, the spirits with, me, with him, firstly, they come and attack the person who gives him the message, so they, they try and attack themselves. When that doesn't work the way they want it to do, they try to go back to him and influence him back into that place. It took him nearly nine months of really strong effort to get out of this emotion that he was willing to do anything they said. And he traced it back to trying to get the approval of his mum and dad all the time, an emotion that he had. And, that, and he's still working his way through that emotion. Now when he speaks to these spirits, he can speak to them still, and he's always been able to speak to them. And now when he speaks to them, he can feel their intention sometimes is malevolent. Whereas before he couldn't even feel it. He was so just engrossed in doing whatever they said. So it's very, very dangerous. This is a very important emotion that you brought up, Christina. Do not abdicate responsibility for your own life. Ever. Yes, yes. Yeah. And it's easy for spirits to influence you in that regard as soon as you have that. Uh, spirits can be in different uh, uh, levels, but guides and uh, guardians, are they always in higher levels? Uh... Your guides or guardians are always, in every case, higher in higher condition than you yourself are. Does that make sense? The problem is that in New Age circles you are often told somebody is your guide or guardian when they are not. Because the, the, when you go to sit down with a medium, the medium is feeling and communicating with the spirits that are with you. Now those spirits can falsify their condition, and if this medium is not sensitive to that occurring, then they can say, oh, this person is your guide, when it's not your guide at all. Now if you trust that, and without feeling through it, then you will have trouble in your life following the guidance of that particular guide. Yes? Yep. So the key is to make sure that the medium actually knows that this is your guide, if you're going to do it, and that you can feel that is your guide. Because your guide will confirm their own experience with you. Yes? And it's better to trust your own emotions in that regard than trust anybody else's, really. Yeah. Why do we bother with all these guides and guardians when we have God? And it's a very good question. <laughs> the reason why God has created that system, because it's actually God that instituted the system, was because most people on earth are so self-reliant that they've become detuned from God. And now they need people in between themselves and God in order to guide them. The reality is, once you become at one with God, you no longer ever need a guide or a guardian. You will have people assisting you in your further progression, because they'll, they'll know things, but you'll just see them as another fellow or another woman that you can connect with and have a good discussion with and learn something from. You won't see them as a person who's guiding you or guarding you in your life. The problem is that, from God's perspective, is that we are so detuned from God as a human race that, uh, and even people who think they're religious are very detuned from God, because you can see that through their actions, yes? Um, people who are detuned from God um, do things that are very unloving generally, and, and this can be seen quite regularly, whether they're religious or not. We are so detuned as a human race from God that God has instituted these people, these spirits that God trusts to assist you with your life. Mm. But it's a very good question. And in addition to that, uh, how do you know the difference when you connect to God or to, to a celestial, celestial angel or a guide or God? Um, how do you know the difference? Well, for most people on earth, it is very, very difficult to know the difference. Because actually, for most people on Earth, anybody who is in a second sphere condition 
already feels much better than they themselves feel. And in fact, I've, I've, I've talked to spirits who believe that God in the second sphere, right? So there's a lot of belief in, in, in amongst the spirit world that every spirit is a God in their own right, you know, a part of God. And I've talked to spirits in the second sphere who believe they're God, who have given people on earth in the first dimension, in the first sphere, you know, in terms of their condition, a feeling, and that person on earth has believed that they're now talking to God. So, so it's a good question. <laughs> and spirits up until the sixth dimension can believe they are God. And there are many spirits in that dimension who do believe they are God. Um, you know uh, Buddha, you've heard of Buddha, yes? yes. Of course you have. <laughs> Buddha is in the sixth dimension and believes he is God. He has not progressed beyond the sixth dimension of the spirit world and he believes he's become God. He's very difficult to talk to because he believes he's all in all. He doesn't believe in his own personality anymore. Yeah. So, very, very hard to help a spirit like that. Now, the question was, how do we know? It's a very, very good question. Any, and a lot of times you can't know instantly, particularly given our development on Earth. We often can't know instantly. We have to go through a process of experimentation. And this is where our fear becomes very important. See, if we're afraid, we generally don't go through experiments. We, we, we want to know the outcome before we begin, yes, when we're afraid. When you're not afraid, you are willing to engage in experiment to see what is really the case. So, so what we can do um, is we can engage in experiment. Now, I haven't described this experiment to you, I don't think, but I have described it many times in many previous um, discussions. I actually described it to the people recently in England. If this is your soul, this is my soul, and this is God, if you have a longing for God's love to enter you, in that moment, if it is a pure desire, so in other words, if it's not tainted with desire for glory, desire for power, a desire for knowing things that you don't know, or any other of those kind of desires, but rather it's a pure desire just to be loved by God, that automatically protects you from any other influence in that moment. God herself actually protects you through that process <coughs> in that moment. But it has to be a pure desire. And this is where we've got to be humble and truthful with ourselves. You see, many of us have desires for power, desires for glory, desires for attention, desires for approval, desires for acceptance and so forth. And if we engage those desires, then we could connect to other spirits. And some of them could even be quiet. Now, don't they? Does that make sense? But if we have a pure desire, a pure longing, I, I often call it, for God and God's love to enter us, in that moment we are protected from this influence of anyone else, anybody else, on earth or in the spirit world action. And we are completely protected in that moment. And in that moment you will find if love enters you, it will be it can only be from God in that moment. Now if it doesn't enter you, it's because you are not humble enough or you are holding on to some untruth. Because remember we have to be humble to receive love and we've got to be in harmony with truth when we receive love. So, so what you do is you have a sincere longing for God's love to enter you and in that moment you are automatically protected from external influences if the longing is sincere and pure, if it's, if it's completely without ulterior motives, then, then you are protected. 
If you do not receive love in that moment, it is because of your own humility or truth. Lack of humility or truth in that moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Very simple. Very simple. Now, if you have emotions of longing for power, glory, attention, approval and other emotions, then you're not in a pure longing for God's love. You are in a longing for power, glory, attention, approval. And many spirits will be involved in helping you to obtain those particular emotions. But God will not be. Right? Now some of these spirits might be in better condition than you, and so it will feel a very powerful experience. Right? I have a question. Uh, can we mention the more people except yourself that is like trustworthy? Because you were saying about many things that you should be very uh, careful about this, very careful about this and all that. Mm -hmm. can, can you mention some uh, more people that, that are trustworthy, like you said, like you mentioned Buddha, just like he's on earth, trustworthy. you mean, or in the spirit world? I mean, on, the, on earth. On earth. Is it any more teachers that is trustworthy, except for yourself? Have you ever heard any of these things before? What, what you're speaking about? Yeah. Yes. You've heard all of this about the 22nd dimension, you've heard all about the soul union, you've heard all about this before. It's, uh, I have not heard everything about this, but I've heard a lot of this. Have you heard this explanation about reincarnation before? Uh, not exactly this way, no. No? Now, what I'm suggesting to you is you, you've not actually heard much of what I've said before, except there's been bits and pieces before, but not put together in this manner. And the reason why is because there is no one on earth who actually does know the truth, and that's the reason why I've returned to teach the truth. So you are the only one who can say this to me, is that what you're saying? I'm the only one you'll hear it from at the moment. And until you personally go through an experience, you will not trust it. Do you understand? It's like, um, the only, I'm not asking you to trust me. What I'm asking you to do is to experiment with these things, these things that I'm talking about. That's well, right. Can I say something? But you're worried about the dangers in the experimentation? No. no? I, I think, I, I just, I promised myself to be honest to myself. Yeah, yeah. And Fine. Uh, I actually think that some of the things you are seeing here, yeah. and uh, now I think I know what you want to answer, but it doesn't matter because it, it's my, uh, it's my responsibility to myself and also to others. I agree. I think you, many of these things you're talking about is like, in a way, old-fashioned, like Christianity thing, like you put the fingers into well, Where did Christianity can begin I, with, my can I, can I continue? Of course. Yes. And uh, I, uh, for example, to, uh, yeah, you have said many things like this, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I think uh, you uh, actually make, I think, I don't know, because I can just speak for myself. Of course. I feel very like, uh, with ease with this, you know, uh, but I think it's, I don't know, because it, this is the rest of the audience, I, I think you, like, uh, it confuses uh, people a bit, and maybe uh, even don't help them, because you have a lot of knowledge, and I, I'm sure you, this is your truth about this. For me it's different, it's going to take time. I, I'm happy to sit down and speak with you with a little longer time, because it would be very nice to do that. Because for me, I have a lot of experiences mm -hmm. through what you call God, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, for me, it doesn't work, work in this technical way. It's, a, it's, a, it's another kind of an experience, how, you, uh, uh, how this works it, for me. And I'm speaking for myself, mm -hmm. and I know what I have experienced. And some of these things, you say, you come to this level, and it's very hard to go over there, and all these people and book dates, this and this and that. that. That's not my truth, because I have also met uh, a lot of, you know, I'm not so familiar with your uh, kind of, uh, uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, you, you, you have some, uh, uh, 
Ah, whatever. Uh, how, how you speak, uh, the kind of name to different things, you know. I have not, uh, I, I, I'm a self uh, learned uh, person. I have not read a lot of books with the different kind of stuff. I, I'm self learned, you know. And, but I have experienced a lot of stuff. And uh, uh, I think, uh, for me, things are. Yeah, it's not working like this. Many things you say is, 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 is true, and some of the things are, or is not, you know? Oh, you that, 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 that's why I'm saying this, and I, I, I'm sure, you know, this is a very special situation in this room, because uh, I'm, uh, when I say this, I'm, I'm sure that some of my, the people in this room is feeling the same thing what I'm feeling, mm -hmm. and then you can very easily say, oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm the only one on this planet, and I have come back and do this thing. And if you sit here and say things like, you have put it out, not so very nicely, not so humble, like some of you have some spirits, they are not so nice, they are actually really bad, they go around, and like, instead of being very honest, and, and, and for example, say that to people, for example, me or whatever, if you find someone who has very bad spirits running around, I think you should uh, tell that to the people instead of just throw it out in the air, because I don't think it's very nice. And, uh, yeah, I don't agree with it. No, no, I, I know we don't agree about stuff, that, no. I mean, that's natural, but I'm, I'm sure uh, why I'm speaking now is because people are agreeing what I'm saying. So even if I should say, is somebody agreeing what I'm saying, it's so much like, it's a very special situation, so maybe not people should agree and uh, admit these things. Because you have a certain, you can say, technique how you act in this room, and like be very careful, and be very careful. I, I don't think it's very nice, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You're entitled to your opinion. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do, do not, can I speak with you later, or are you going to be going No, no, because... Uh, after, yeah, I mean later, you, you stay for one more week, can, can we meet? Well, I, I don't see little, little, I see little point. Um, because, because it feels to me that you're very close to what I might present. I am not. Well, I'm very open to this. But you're, you're, you're not willing to meet me, or are you too afraid of this one? <laughs> Mostly from a point of view of I have my own life and I want to have, like, we spend a lot of time doing these things for free and we spend some time, we're going, we've already arranged some of our week this week with different people and uh, then the other times that I have available I'd like to spend with my partner Mary and just looking around Gothenburg and doing some personal things, that's the main reason why. But then if you're, uh, like, you say you do it for free, it's some, you say of some reason. I can, if you're willing to meet me, I can pay you. Yes, you can be more comfortable. I don't want to be paid. No, it's but you said you didn't. No, no, it's not. About, uh, no, no, it's not about. It's not about being paid. It's about. Why did you say? Because the, because I am giving you a gift right now of my yeah. time for free. Yeah. But secondly, I also want to have my own life. Yeah. <laughs> and this is, I feel, what you're not respecting here in this discussion. Even you're wanting me to engage something with yourself without allowing me to even have my own life a bit. Like, this is the very first time I'm in Sweden. I want to also experience some of Sweden, besides experiencing some of the people in Sweden. And, uh, and so that's what myself and Mary hope to do this week. And we also, like, so we're spending Saturday, yesterday, with people, Sunday with people. And usually I like to have a day or two off. Monday, Tuesday is probably gone there, because I want to spend that time with Mary. Wednesday will be with people again. And then Saturday is with people again, and it depends on what happens in between there as to who I can visit and see. And so, and my attraction is towards people who uh, feel very open towards um, wanting to discuss further these matters. And so, so I would be very open to discussing the matters, but, but I feel from yourself a very strong desire to, to be close towards a lot of these matters. So, so there are other people in the audience that I can feel are very much more open than yourself, and so I'll be definitely more attracted to spending that time with them than I would be currently with yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, so that's the way I feel at the moment. But, but I'm perfectly open to discuss with any person any of these things. And I can answer some of your questions though. You, you state that this is very technical, 
And I'm saying to you, well, I say to you that God has created every scientific thing in the universe, and God has a lot of scientific, technical knowledge that we can deliver. Everything, though, is still surrounding this. You also say that I'm not very humble because I claim that I'm the only person that knows these things. However, that is the truth. And, and I'm afraid that, uh, like, like, see, this is the problem with the... With the I, I didn't say you were not humble, you were the only one. I, I like people who stand up for who they think they are or who they are. I, yeah. That's why one of the reasons I'm here, I said it's not very humble to s s s say to an audience that some of you have some spirits really ba like bad ones and some is high. I think it's more straightforward, that's why I said... No, I, I, I feel it's very humble. Can I explain why? Yeah. The reason why is because I'm honouring something, and I'm honouring a person's free will to discover, right? If I come to you and I say, Michael, you're over by this spirit, that spirit, this spirit, that spirit, this person, and you don't want to know that. I wait for you to do that. They are very interesting to hear that. No, I'm sorry, but I cannot agree, Michael. But you cannot agree, but I ask the, you to do it. No, but, but the feeling okay. coming from your soul is that you do not wish to know. Yes, I wish to know this. Well, the feeling yes. I'm feeling from you is the opposite of that. Well, it's easy for you to say like this. Well, I don't know about other people, what they feel from you, but this is what I feel from you. And, and all I can do is be honest with you about what I feel from you. I can't be honest with you. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm honest. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. I know. You're right. up a lot of time right oh, yes. now. Yes. No, no. Uh, 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 can, we, can we just hang on a second? I agree. However, you are now angry. And anger is not love. And anger is not humility. Do you understand? I understand. This is why I wish to engage Michael, because if it annoys the hell out of you, we can find out who's really lucky. I'm feeling it. And we can find out who's really humble. I'm finding Michael now more loving than you are. Does that make sense? Because you're now projecting at Michael an emotion that he does not deserve. He's got, he's got my feelings up, he's got reasonable requests, and I'm just explaining to him why I can't necessarily accede to them all. Does that make sense? But he does not deserve your anger. Right? And, and this, nobody does, in fact, deserve your anger. You understand? So, <laughs> what would you like to say? I want to ask to learn something from this situation. Yes. Uh, how to deal with my feelings yes. in this situation. So what are your feelings? My feelings is that uh, I, I, I think I'm sitting here in the morning and listen to you both speaking to each other and hear that you have different perspective. Yes. And I appreciate so much that we listen to you because this affects me more. And it doesn't mean that there is something wrong with the other. I but agree. I, I like this more. Yep. And how to deal with my feelings when I think it takes time and I was in, in a very good mood for 10 minutes ago. And, uh, and now you're not. Now, and what, what is hum, hum, humility? I, I will learn from it. Well, I, can I describe something that's love? It's not love. Like if, if I was loving, and I, there are many presentations I go to. Right? As you can imagine. So I go to, I sit down and I listen to the person. I do not do what Michael has just done. The reason why I don't, even what I, with what I know, is because I feel that person has set up the event, they've paid for the facilities, they've organised the event, they have the right to present whatever they wish to present, and I have either a choice to be there or not. And so I would not interfere with the discussion or break up the discussion as Michael has done myself because I feel it's an issue of love. Right? And Michael feels more connected with himself perhaps than with myself and so he doesn't see that as an issue of love. He just sees himself standing up for your rights and, and your right to question and so forth. And while I, I agree with this right that you have to question, I would question about the environment in which it's done. For myself, if I went along to another person to listen to them, I would just allow them to make the comments that they made. I would not feel like I have to influence any of the rest of the audience who have been attracted to be there. I would just feel my own feelings about what's being presented, and if I disagreed with it, I would disagree with it, 
And if somebody asked me directly, do you agree with this or not? I would say, no, I don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. And if, do you want to know why or not? And if they wanted to know why, then I would tell them, right? That's what I would do if I was a member of my own, of any audience. And I have been the member of many audiences. So I've gone along to listen to people like Deepak Chopra and Wayne Dyer and other spiritual teachers, right? And I've listened to them. And I can't agree with much of what they present because of different reasons. But I don't sit there and annoy and interrupt their flow of conversation during that process because I feel love for them and I feel they have the right to state and feel whatever they state and feel without anybody in the audience sort of upsetting the flow of their, of their statements and conversation. This is why many of you are reacting to Michael because you don't have enough love to get over the situation and respond differently yet. Shall I say? You see, if you have love, you would feel differently. I also feel, though, to be frank, that if Michael had more love, he would not be able to do what he's doing, understanding the effect that it's having on the rest of the audience. He would not be able to do that. That is also my personal opinion, and I understand that Michael feels differently to that. Now, the reason why I haven't asked Michael to leave is because he has not been like other people that I've met in the audiences, where they are angry, abusive, demanding, interrupting your questions, and many of you have had an opportunity to ask questions. Michael's only asked a few. Many of you have had an opportunity to ask many questions, and I've given you that opportunity. Michael also needs to be given the same opportunity. That's loving Michael. And so that's the way I treat the audience. I'm not expecting any of you to <laughs> understand that or agree with it or anything like that. That's just the way I deal with my audiences. So. In the case of Michael, I do feel there is a closeness there to receiving the truth. Now, Michael disagrees with me, and I understand his disagreement, and I can feel that. But I do feel that there is this honouring of a particular thing, which is free will. I am giving you the opportunity to express your free will by what you do. However, we've got to understand that in a group situation, there is a collective will. Right? And if your collective will is to continue to hear me speak, then stick around and hear me speak. If your collective will is to leave, then, uh, then you can all leave. But if you, and if your individual will is to leave or hear me speak, then do whatever you wish. However, we've got to see what's love and what isn't. Now, I don't feel that what Michael has done was love, but I also don't feel what you just did to Michael was love either. Does that make sense? And what many of the others of you have done to Michael is not love either. And this is the beauty of discussions about love is that they bring up these emotions and help us confront to confront what's really going on emotionally and that's beautiful I feel that's a great opportunity to learn about love and my, my feelings are that um, there is a flow of conversation that occurs naturally when two people are open. So somebody might ask a question and instantly somebody else gives an answer. It's a bit like you often see this in a group of women sitting around about, around a coffee shop and, and they're all drinking their cuppa and they're back and forth, back and forth. There's all this conversation going on but everyone's feeling like, they're, like they've got some interaction happening. That can happen in much larger groups, the same sort of flow like that. It only stops when we want to get a point across, but we don't want to listen. Now, yesterday this happened a number of times. You, you remember the man who had the mobile phone go off? Mm -hmm. I don't know his name, some of you may know him. And he had the mobile phone go off right at the front of the audience. Now, and, and then he walked past the camera, which is already an unloving thing, because the camera is recording these events for lots of people, not just for yourselves. Goes up the back. He doesn't turn off his mobile phone. He talks on it. He comes back in, sits at the back, and still doesn't turn off the mobile phone. Now that was an act of that was an unloving act, because if he loved, he would have turned off his mobile phone if he really wanted to be here. It was also an unloving act towards myself, because he's showing me that it's more important for him to respond to a mobile phone call than it is to be at the presentation. And the only reason why he's staying is because it's free. He doesn't have to listen to it. And that's a lack of respect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If I respected somebody who I was going along to a presentation with, 
I would always turn off my mobile phone, as Mary knows, I always do. I don't even have a mobile phone to turn off most of the time on me, so that's not an issue. And I always listen diligently without actually making any comment if I disagree. That's how I am with the person. If I'm the person in the audience. If I'm the person up here, it's a bit different. I arranged this, and many of you helped me in this process of arranging this because you wanted to listen. And actually, I have paid for each hall. The very chair that you're sitting on is hired by me at the moment. I've paid Johan for the hire of each hall. Right? And I did that, and I've done that before we've received donations for it. So, so the reality is, we have created this so that you can come along and listen for free. And my feelings are that if you honour that, you have the potential of learning some things that you may not have known. You also can disagree with any of it, that is your call. But to disagree with it publicly, you have to question your underlying motive. And I feel your underlying motive, if you're disagreeing with me publicly, is to prove to other people that you disagree with me publicly. And I don't see any need for that, because it's obvious that many people here disagree with me, and that's okay. You're allowed to, because I, I feel you're allowed to, and whether I felt it or not, you are allowed to disagree. However, it comes down to what is loving in the interaction, every single time. And I believe what is loving is that we honour and respect the others who do want to hear and who do want to listen, and not interrupt their flow and not interrupt that flow of conversation. That's the loving thing to do. Yeah, what I really love about your teaching is that it's so practical. Like, you can really interact. Like, it doesn't matter where it is or with who, whom it is. You can yes. really, like, like the situation now, yep. you can feel, okay, my feeling was that, okay, I was unloving, even though I didn't verbalize something. Yes. Like, you can really um, focus on yourself. See, if you were really honest with yourself, how many of you felt an emotion of annoyance with Michael? Uh, all of you projected unloving emotions at Michael. Now, we're coming to learn about love, right? And then we do something unloving. <laughs> now, does that make sense to you? <laughs> like, surely if we come to learn about love, then we should look at what's unloving. And this is very important. And it doesn't matter how unloving we feel the other person is being. Do you understand? This is what I said yesterday, remember? Even if somebody slaps you in the face, is violent with you, there is still a need to be loving. And Michael certainly has not done that to any of you. And yet there's still, there's still a need for you to be loving. You see? Very important, that this love issue. <laughs> Much more... And, and this also illustrates that we often think we're developed in it, but then a situation happens that proves to us, oh, I'm not as developed in the love as I thought I was. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I just thought the latest question was very um, good about <coughs> what, to, how, what is humility in action then? How, okay, I'm not loving, I know it. How do I, how do I practice humility? I feel that is a very good question. Um, so let's say, Michael was even worse. Let's say he was the same as a guy who was in um, England that we had that was very, you know, really interrupting everybody. And, and this went on in England for 25 minutes. Every single person who put up their hand asked a question, he interrupted their question. Right? And it just went on like this. A lot of disrespect in the man, right? Now, let's say that happened to you. What are you feeling? For most people, it's like... <clears throat> anger, right? There's this feeling of anger. So, so, if you were humble, what would you do? You would feel the anger. You wouldn't project it at the person. You'd sit there and go, oh, I'm so angry, I'm so angry. And you would allow yourself to feel into this anger as to why you're so angry. This man's only doing a, a, a talking. <laughs> That's all he's doing. <laughs> Why can that make you so angry? Uh, there's got to be something in there for us. What do you feel? So let's go feel the anger and then feel underneath the anger. What are you feeling? What's the anger? Fear. Fear. Uh, well, it, let's, let's not intellectualize too much. Just the feeling. Feel the feeling. What's the feeling that you feel? Suppressed. Uh, you feel controlled? controlled? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Many of you are feeling control. Yeah. What else? Disrespected. Disrespected. 
What else? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable, yeah, just a general discomfort. Oh, what's this gonna what's this gonna escalate to? Uh, discomfort? What else? Fearful. Fearful, but let's be more specific. See, with fear you can't just go go fear. Well, let's, fear let's of be... agitation of something is going to escalate. Okay, yeah. so that's a fear of the potential of something happening, right. isn't it? So or what are you afraid of? So you're afraid of fights, yeah, a potential fight. Yeah, what else? Unworthy to be heard, or is that, yeah, so what would you say that? Uh, unheard, should we call that? Um, how many of you felt your time was being wasted? Time, yeah. Okay, so, so what would you call that? That's what call? Waste of time. We're wasted time, but when you feel your time's being wasted, what, what's the emotion? Stolen. My time is stolen from me. Stolen. stolen. So you feel like things are being stolen from you, yes? Yeah. This is a lot of emotion, then. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so, so these are the emotions that are underneath this anger that you felt towards poor, poor Michael. Does that make sense? So, so these are the emotions. And every one of you had a different one of these emotions that you were unwilling to feel. In other words, you weren't humble to feeling it. And when you're not humble to feeling it, what happens? You project the anger at the person that you believe is the cause of these emotions. He's not met most of you before. How can he be the cause of these emotions in you? He didn't bring you up. He wasn't your mother or your father. Right? He wasn't, you know, your brother or your sister. So how has he had anything to do with these emotions being created in you? Can you see? You see what we do is we, we, we forget this. We forget where these emotions are coming from. <coughs> these emotions are coming from things prior to meeting Michael. Right? Pr prior. These emotions are within us that we have un been unable to feel. In other words, we have not previously had the humility to feel them. And so what we have done with them is we've used anger to control the person who we believe is creating these emotions in us. Can you see? And in the process of trying to control, we are willing to damage him. We go out of love and into another emotion. And the other emotion is anger, rage, right? upset, all these other emotions, yes? And this is the problem. This is the problem, you see. This is what happens on a day-to-day -day basis around the earth every minute of the day. You think about your life, every minute of your life. It's a great practical example of what goes on. Where we believe we're loving, and we are not. Because the instant and the situation occurs, it, all of the unlovingness in us rises up. Yes. Sorry. But I think the big issue is that we are, are relying on others. So when others are treating us not like we expect expect yep. us to treat, and yep. um, we feel not love, we feel other things, and in the end we want to feel love. Yes. And I think the only thing is to connect to God and to feel. Yes. To feel, to now, feel if you were permanently connected to God, you can you see? It doesn't matter what happens around you; you would still be loving every single time. Right? But for, for most of us, instead we have these emotions to feel and we choose to not feel them in that moment. We choose to avoid them in that moment. We choose to make the person who we feel is the source of those emotions to go away. Right? And this is the trouble. This is the problem we have. We need to change that. We need to change this globally. Like it needs to be a global change, if possible. But it has to start with us. You know, that somebody who knows this is happening needs to change this from happening. And if, and if we each do this, then we have the ability to love people no matter what happens and no matter what they project at us. Now, Michael was probably not aware that many of you were feeling control. 
he was not aware that many of you are feeling like disrespected or discomfort or feeling that there was a potential fight going to happen and you're a bit worried about that and feeling that you're unheard or feeling that your time was being stolen. Michael was probably not aware. That I, I, I'm aware of that. You're aware? So the question then becomes, well, why did you consider your unloving behaviour? I didn't follow you. Did I? If you're aware that these emotions exist in the rest of the audience, why do you then continue doing what you're doing? No, I'm not provoking. I'm, uh, I have already said it, actually. Like, uh... No, but you're not understanding what I'm saying, Michael, now. You were choosing to not be loving. No, I'm not agreeing about this. I know you don't agree, Michael, but that's what I'm suggesting to you. You're suggesting, but I, I, you cannot like force that into me. I, I, I agree. You just said something. Now I have to answer for the respect for myself and others that I was not aware about these things. Oh, I thought you just said that, that you were. What's happening when somebody? First of all, I also want to say you invited to like uh, uh, you you didn't uh, use the word interactive conversation, but you said in the early morning. Let's have a conversation. You no, I'm aware of questions, yes. Yeah. And for me, like in a place like this, when we talk about these important things about life and God, really big things, and you talk about hell and these things, it's very big things. Then I think it's very uh, important to tell the truth from yourself. And I think. But can I say. Can I ask? No, 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 Michael. No, you can't. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't now. And the reason why you can't... It's not, it's not good to not do it. Uh, no, because you're, you're taking over the entire conversation again like you were I mean, before. You have continued to do it. You have, to, you have stopped it ten minutes ago. Yeah, but, but, and but, then but, you go back to me and say, I'm not aware. See, and now I'm you need to leave. <laughs> now you need to leave. No. No, you do need to leave right now. No, why? Well, if, if you don't leave, I'm going to call the police. Call Okay. And um, is there someone here with a mobile phone? Yeah. Yep. You are now not respecting myself nor the rest of this audience. Uh, if, if you, you know, say you call the police, do you show yourself? Yeah, before I call the police, I'd like to thank you, Michael, because you've given us a very good lesson here today. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. And goodbye. I'm going to call the police. Yes. I'm asking you to leave, Michael, and you're not respecting the fact that I actually hired this all. And you're not but doing you what I to end the conversation. And no, like I have now I have now ceased that invitation to yourself. Yeah. You then need you, then you, have to call the police. you need then to leave. To okay, see so yeah. this this now demonstrates how unloving you are. Yeah. To every single person here. Yeah. And the police. And the police. <laughs> <laughs> and the police have become all the way police have to come all this way just because of your unloving behaviour. No, it's not. No, it's because of your unloving behaviour. You need to leave. You need to leave. Everyone here would like you to leave. Can I ask you one thing? If you, if you, if you take it back that you threaten to call the police because I just had a conversation and had my food. No, then, I have. Then I leave. Mean, but if, if, if you don't. You refuse to leave, that's why I've yeah, asked the call the police. Please. So you've refused to leave. Okay. So you need to leave. Okay, Mr. Call the police. And I apologise to the rest yeah. of you for this interaction, yeah. but. Uh, Unfortunately, it has to happen. I'm the person who hired the hall. If I was coming along to one of your productions, I would never do what you're doing here. Never. Well, what you're doing is very unloving. Um, it's 
probably the time when we're going to finish anyway. So <laughs> I don't think the police are going to come before Michael leaves. Sorry? Oh. You wanted to hear about this? Yes. And can we continue that conversation next time we get together? Or will you not be here? Uh, okay. So next time we get together, we can continue that. What is the time? Of? 20 to 7. It's time to finish anyway. But, Michael, you are not welcome to our next gathering. If you arrive, I definitely will call the police. And it's only because you're being unloving to everybody here. We are in the first location. Yes. You're talking about. So next Saturday, yeah. we are in the location we were in yes. first Saturday. Yes. 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 Is it Sunday also? Or is it Sunday? Only Saturday. Yeah. Only Saturday. Saturday is our last discussion. From one. Thank you very much. From one. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I realise your time is precious too. So thank you for your time as well. Okay. Good night. Good night.